welcome you to the Jim Owls Club. Uh, we have monthly meetings. A lot of people want to know what's going on with the DA's race. Most of us don't know all the candidates. So we decided that we should all get together and meet. And we wanted to open this up to all the people who are somewhat involved with Jim Owls. Um, we consider this one of the most important races um, in 2021. Um, we send out literature and our bids to support people. And we did over 50,000 pieces of literature in four boroughs for this um, previous election in June. We're gonna get very involved with the district attorney's race. We don't want a district attorney who is just qualified and knows their job and continues to do the status quo. We want a district attorney that people across the nation are gonna take notice of. We want a district attorney like District Attorney Boone in San Francisco, District Attorney in Philadelphia, um, Eric Gonzalez. But we want Manhattan to be the showcase of the nation. We want a district attorney who's going to get people out of prison and not spend all that time locking people up. We want a district attorney that is not gonna pride themselves on getting along with the police department. We want a district attorney that's gonna pride themselves on getting along with the left in the borough. We want somebody that's gonna talk our politics and is gonna take our priorities, and many, for the people my age, our priorities are the priorities of the 60s. We want a district attorney who isn't gonna tell us they support Black Lives Matter. We want a district attorney that shows us by their actions on a daily basis that they support Black Lives Matter. We don't want rhetoric. We want to be the showcase of the nation as far as a district attorney. We have not had that. We have not had that. We have not had a district attorney who went up to, the, to um, Bedford or Sing Sing or Otisville to visit people and to try to get people out. No, we have not had that. Eric Gonzalez has done some of that. We need a DA who's going to revolutionize. Just like we're working to defund the police, we're going to be working to redefine the office of the DA. And that's why we're meeting tonight to see who's willing to stand up and represent the left and revolutionize what a DA does in the borough of Manhattan. We have one minute to go. Our first candidate, we have all nine candidates, and we're going to do our best to end tonight at nine o'clock so people could go put on the um, Democratic National Convention. Um, in my 30 seconds, I'm going to say I hope everybody is really working hard to um, elect a new president, you know, um, Joe Biden, and that's the first step. A DA is going to be great and really, really important, but I don't have to lecture. You're all committed. So for those of you who are not in Manhattan, be involved with this race because this will be the bellwether for the nation. That's what we have to see that happens. Okay, is Diane Florence on? Yes, I am. Okay, great. You have three minutes to make a presentation. And then we're gonna to go to about 17 minutes of questions and answers. If people have questions, messenger them to me. Um, Lewis, Child, and Brown and I will be looking at them. We will ask questions from what people send and a bunch of stock questions that we want answers from all the candidates. In addition, we sent a very lengthy questionnaire to the candidates that we're giving them until the second week of September to answer because it's very lengthy and some of the questions are very involved and we will share that with all the attendees. Diane, it's yours, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here and be able to introduce myself to you. So my name is Diana Florence, I'm a native New Yorker and I'm running for Manhattan DA to fight for people who never thought they'd win. I'm a proud public servant who started under Robert Morgenthau. And he taught me to put people first 
and to follow the facts without fear or favor, mm -hmm. wherever that might lead. And so what that meant at the beginning of my career was working alongside women and children to hold accountable their abusers in domestic violence cases. Later, that meant uh, holding accountable those that defrauded 9-11 charities to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then later, as the leader of the first of its kind construction fraud task force, I created a community-based co-enforcement model where I brought together community members, government agencies, business associations, tenants, labor unions, and so many others to the decision-making table. And we collaborated. And that's where we learned about the problems that were happening on the ground before they became entrenched. And we focused on corruption and how to hold those accountable who committed crimes of power. So together, working with that community, we achieved groundbreaking success. Uh, that included a record-breaking $6 million wage theft case where we held accountable not only the company, but the owner as well. And also going after developers and companies that put workers' lives behind their very profits. And right not too far from where Jim Owls, I think, normally sits, was one of the landmark cases involving Carlos Moncayo, and he was buried alive at the former site of Pastis. And I'm proud of that case because not only did we get justice for Carlos, but for hundreds of his coworkers who were also the victim of, of wage theft. I've, I've worked on behalf of immigrants using the criminal law to, to, uh, to champion them and to get justice for them. I have never been afraid to pursue the powerful inside and outside of the courtroom. And that includes doing things that you wouldn't normally think a prosecutor would do. I'm proud to have written wage theft legislation uh, with Catalina Cruz in the assembly. And I'm proud to have become an expert in using the criminal law to hold corrupt companies accountable who put profit before safety. Most recently serving on a panel with Yulin Nu and Zephyr Teachout talking about holding Amazon accountable for its failings and its blatant disregard of PPE. I'm also immensely proud of the work I did over 25 years that resulted in my announcing my candidacy alongside eight labor unions endorsements in less than two weeks. To me, it's the passion that I have for the people of New York and the work and using the criminal law to make people's lives better and to make the Manhattan District Attorney's Office a place of opportunity, not obstacle. I wanna lead the office back to where it's supposed to be. We forgot who we were fighting for. I've always fought for the people and that's what I will do if elected to lead this office. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna start. Um, elder parole, the bill um, in Albany that would um, mandate that people 55 years or older who are in prison for 15 years or more are eligible to appear before the parole board. Do you favor that? Yes or no, please? Yes. Okay, solitary confinement. Do you oppose solitary confinement? Yes. Okay, determination of parole. Do you believe that sincere remorse, risk of offending, and risk um, assessment um, should determine whether it be a major part of determination whether somebody gets out as opposed to their original crime. Of course. Okay. Um, will you, as district attorney, visit people and in institutions, um, people who are um, constituents of yours, um, who, who to see whether or not their bids to get out, and if you believe that they should get out, will you lobby? Um, and, and be involved? Will you visit Bedford? Will you visit Otisville? Will you visit Sing Sing and correctional facilities like that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, the Working While Trans Bill, um, the DA gets involved in, um, in, a, in um, doing the charges against people who are trans who um, get arrested simply because they're walking in the street. Will you take a public position and will you lobby for the bill to pass the Walking Wall Trans Bill in Albany? Yes, I support that bill. 
Okay, sex work. Um, do you support decrim? And will you lobby for that, lend your name to the effort? And will you oppose passage of the Nordic model? So I do not support the criminalization of sex work. I believe that it chills the ability for the victim, victims of sex trafficking to feel comfortable coming forward to law enforcement. Um, so I, I do support the decriminalization of sex work. I do think we have to be very mindful of the way that we draft the bills to ensure that we don't enable uh, another Jeffrey Epstein or a sex trafficker. So while I am supported of it, um, I, we need to be very careful the way we draft the, the, the bills and, 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 and tread lightly about that. Okay, just to add, we're all against trafficking. We all want safeguards in trafficking. We're talking about sex between consenting adults with an exchange of money. Um, have you participated? Uh, people, please send me your questions. Um, I anticipated people would be um, sending um, their questions. Um, do you can, um, what have you done in the LGBT community to um, warrant support? Do you consider yourself a member? Have you marched in, um, in pride? And as part of that, what d demonstrations, rallies, and protests in support of choice, LGBT, criminal justice, clemency, and the Resist Trump movement have you participated in over the years and the Women's March? So I, I have, uh, I consider myself an ally of the LGBTQ community and I've worked uh, in the context of my role as Construction Fraud Task Force as, as a fierce advocate for worker safety and worker health. I'm very mindful of the fact that especially trans people um, are often victims of workplace violence uh, and degradation and also wage theft. So I've fought uh, on behalf of those, that, that population. Now that I'm uh, no longer a prosecutor uh, in, in the district attorney's office, I look forward to being able to do more overtly political things. And um, that's what I've done over the last few months. And I continue to engage. I've also worked, I should say, I've gone to many uh, events and, and uh, met with people from uh, the, the center uh, on 14th Street. Okay. Um, talking about trafficking, um, going back to that for a minute, do you support the relief legislation, the record relief legislation that would expand the relief available to the survivors of human trafficking? Of course. Okay. Um, have you participated in any protests or demonstration or press conferences advocating for clemency and parole um, from our present governor, who has been incredibly selfish and stingy in letting people out? And would you publicly ask him to let people out, especially seniors who are susceptible to getting the coronavirus? I believe in justice. And if the, if the facts warrant that people should be released they shouldn't be uh, subject to a death sentence in pr prison. And of course, I would uh, pr uh, participate in rallies such as that. And okay, yeah, I'm sure you're aware that the governor of California has released thousands of people, many who committed serious crimes because of the virus and because of his belief in compassion. Um, you would urge the governor to do likewise? I would urge the governor to release people that are at risk of dying. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do not think um, the death sentences have no place. We don't have that in New York State. And if that's. that's, that's, that's okay, somebody got there. It's not you. Okay, um, are there questions? Okay, do you want to tell us? Oh, um, you have to send me the question. Messenger me, Kathy, please. Do you want to tell us why you believe that you would be the kind of DA that we want, a DA that would lead the nation from the left and will be a, a model for reform? What, will you, what can you tell us to make us believe that it won't be politics as usual in the DA's well, office? Thank you. Well, it basically comes down to this. I've done the work. I've led from where I was. I used the criminal law to create uh, uh, opportunities, not obstacles for people. And that meant focusing on crimes of power. 
and holding accountable those who abuse those people who are vulnerable. And, but not doing it from my perch. I left my office. I went, I see some community board members here. I came out, I was a familiar face at community boards. I engaged the public. The model I created um, on, at the task force is the model that I would replicate office-wide. It's really about serving the people. That's what we're here for. And that's, we've lost our way in the DA's office. That's why I left. And frankly, we need to, we need to get back there. I've done the work, I have the experience, I know how to use the criminal law, and, I, I, and, and I'm committed to that. Okay, well, um, the issue of sanctuary cities, um, how would you treat undocumented people um, regarding their appearance in courtrooms or near courtrooms, and how would you protect the rights of, um, of the undocumented? And, um, would you stand up to ICE and would you um, stand up to the White House? So yes, to just go in reverse order, of course I would stand up to ICE and the White House. I've stood up to the powerful my entire career. And, and as how I would protect immigrant, um, it's the way I did throughout my, my work. When I prosecuted wage theft and uh, the manslaughter cases against, uh, against powerful corporations, um, I stood up in court and, and made a motion to make sure that the defense counsel could not ask my witnesses about their immigration status. Um, I, and, and they were precluded from doing so because it's not a bad act. I would also make sure that you don't write anything down. I was always cognizant, this is even before Trump was president, frankly, that you don't write down people's immigration status. You don't put them at risk. And frankly, you don't even ask them about that. Finally, what I did was I pursued the um, getting U visas for victims of, of, of the violence that I prosecuted, and I succeeded in that. So to me, I have been an, an incredible ally to the immigrant community. To me, it doesn't matter whether you are documented or undocumented, everyone has a right to be safe at home, at work, and on the street. Okay, last question. Um, with the demonstrations for Black Lives Matter and income inequality, et cetera, the police are making wholesale um, arrests and in many cases beating people, pepper spraying them, et cetera. How would your office hold the police accountable? I know we know how important it is. DA say, well, you have to get along with the police. We don't believe that. You have to get along with the people. How will you hold the police accountable? And what do you think about defunding the police and, or reducing their budget? Well, I think that it makes no sense to have a $6 billion paramilitary police force when we spend a fraction of that on, on education, after school programs, and mental health. So I would tell you that I, I also believe that when police abuse their power, that they need to be hold, held accountable. And I would do that in the very same way that I held corrupt corporations and executives accountable by proactively investigating and making sure that we, we bring the cases and we bring strong cases. Because what I learned in the construction industry is when you got a conviction against a company that killed a worker or stole millions of dollars in wages, the rest of the industry took notice and they changed their behavior. So it's really important to be really smart about the cases we bring, make them airtight, and then publicize them and make sure that we send a message that the culture needs to change because you will be held accountable. We will be looking. Okay, thank you very, very much. We're gonna be moving along. There are two or three people I wanna introduce. We have the president, we're honored to have the president of Lambda, um, Independent Democrats, and um, Brian Romero, the president of Stonewall. Um, long time lesbian activist, Ann Northrup, and I see our favorite actor, Kathleen Shelfont, who's gonna be doing a new movie, and veteran activist, um, historic Ronnie Eldridge. Thank you all for being on this. And now we're gonna to go to our next candidate, um, Ta um, Tahani Abushi. I hope I said that correct. Yes, you did, I did, Alan, I was watching you. And the floor good. is yours, you have three minutes, and then we're gonna to go to um, questions and answers. I know Kathy had a question, will people messenger me? And Ann Northrop, you must have questions. Okay, the floor is yours, Tahani. 
Thank you so much, Alan, and for the Jim Owls Club for taking the lead and, and hosting this forum. My name is Tahani Abushi, and I'm a civil rights attorney running to be the next district attorney of Manhattan. My passion for undoing and tearing down systems of oppression began at 14 years old when my father was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Overnight, my mother became a single parent of nine siblings, and there was a moment in the proceedings that has stuck with me forever. The judge had interrupted his proceedings, looked at the prosecutor and said, what are you gonna do with all these kids? And he pointed to my nine siblings and I sitting in the pews of his courtroom. And without hesitation, she said, they're not my problem. And so that is the day that the criminal justice system became my problem. It inspired me to become an attorney. And I didn't wanna be that lawyer that just sat in some corner office. I wanted to be among the community, back with families like mine and fight like hell to protect us and to hold powers that be accountable. And so I spent over 10 years holding the law enforcement accountable for use of excessive force. I forced the NYPD to change discriminatory policies that dispar disproportionately impacted black and brown communities. I did the same at the FDNY, also forced them to change policies that disproportionately impacted black and brown communities. And I've also spent the last 10 years representing survivors of sexual assault, including fighting the NYPD and forcing them to take reports and forcing the hands of prosecutors to conduct investigations and let victims know that they will be heard and there will be justice. In jumping in this race for Manhattan District Attorney, it was very important to me that those closest to the problem become closest to the solution and that we lead the way. And when we talk about being progressive, what we need to talk about and we also need to recognize is this fight to end mass incarceration and the mass criminalization of communities of color didn't just start in the last few years. These are issues that families like mine have grappled and struggled with for decades. And so when we talk about a new leadership for the Manhattan DA's office, we don't need an extension of former DA's. Manhattan has had four DA's in the last century. And when elected, I would be the first female and the first person of color to ever hold this office. And that is a result of systemic oppression and racist policies coming from that office. My plan for this office is to give it back to the people, make it transparent, accountable, and collaborative. We boast a $700 million budget. Where is that money going? My plan is to create a collaborative multidisciplinary group that will decide where that money goes. And primarily, it's going to go to community-based organizations that specialize in not only crime prevention, but addressing the root causes of this behavior, which data shows come from social inequities, like mental health and drugs, drug addiction and poverty. And we need to create, and the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we're going to save from those meaningless and useless prosecutions, we can really provide comprehensive victim services. Right now, victims are kicked to hotlines and websites. Instead, we need to provide them financial resources, a safe place to put their head at night while they figure out their situations, and counseling. That's how we take care of people. And in addition to that, we need to see the DA's role as directly responsible for the state of our society. When we talk about the increase in violence in our cities, when we talk about low graduation rates and low home ownership rates and, and the financial instability of our communities, the Manhattan DA's office and DA's office across our country are directly responsible for those inequities and we must be held accountable. Okay. And so that is my hope as a next Manhattan DA and I hope to earn your vote to tear it down and create a system that works for the people. Thank you very much. We're gonna to go to questions. I do wanna say that both um, Bill Thompson is on, um, has joined us and state controller Tom DiNapoli and state Senator Brad Hartman. Welcome aboard and thank you for spending some time with us. Um, will you commit to visiting people who are, who are eligible for um, clemency in state prisons such as Bedford Correctional and Sing Sing, et cetera, um, when people um, make pleas to be released and it's brought to your attention. Absolutely, Alan. I've spent over 15 years visiting my father in prison. So regardless of the reason, that is something I, um, I've been very familiar with and happy to continue. And you base some um, remorse and um, rehabilitation um, and risk assessment. You, you put remorse and rehabilitation above the original crime. 
Absolutely. I think that not only above the original crime, but also the why. Um, a lot of the, the root causes of behaviors are never addressed. And I don't believe that putting someone in, in a, a cell block in, in an industry, in an environment that is violent, violence prone is going to make any difference or make anything better. The elder parole bill, do you support that? Absolutely. I, I believe in the end of the death penalty and that includes death by incarceration. Right. Um, the um, walking while trans bill, Absolutely. I believe that that disproportionately discriminates on not only trans, but also sex workers. And like you mentioned earlier, the sex work is completely different than human trafficking. Um, and for decrim, uh, you know, I've worked closely with those groups and people get involved in sex work by coercion, choice or circumstance. And I believe that that should not be criminalized. Okay. Will you work um, against um, the adopt adopting the um, Nordic model in Albany? Absolutely. Okay. Um, on police misconduct, will you vigorously investigate police misconduct and will you try um, police who, um, who um, conduct violence against protesters, et cetera, or anybody needless violence, will you go ahead and, and, um, and um, bring them to court um, Without, without making the, without going through the determination of the civilian complaint review board, which usually whitewashes it. You know, uh, Alan, I'm the only candidate that you'll never have to guess what I will do in this situation. Based on my track record, you know what I will do. I've already spent over 10 years holding law enforcement accountable, whether it be through termination, discipline, or criminal prosecution. Um, and that was the impetus for making changes in the NYPD patrol guide. I believe that the district attorney's office must be independent from the NYPD and reorient itself as a guardian of justice and rights for the people. And that means separating NYPD and holding them accountable because no one is above the law. Okay, the district attorney in Philadelphia are basically clean house of career um, assistant district attorneys who felt their job was to arrest and get long sentences. He replaced them with many, many legal aid attorneys. Um, would you do likewise? I wouldn't just limit it to legal aid attorneys. I believe that we have to change the culture of this office by hiring people that have walked in the shoes of the people who come before our office. So that not only includes people of color or public defenders, but people who have been through the system, whether as victims or accused. And that is the only way to be able to, through the Early Case Assessment Bureau, where charges are, are are brought against people to assess it and step back and say, okay, we have a homeless man that is accused of stealing socks from Rite Aid. Rite Aid. Are misdemeanor charges and jail time really the appropriate response here? Or is this a symptom of social inequities? And are there other programs that can actually alleviate them? Many people, including most of us, believe that the criminal justice system has become too large and it's costing too much. Would you believe that the police department is bloated? And what would you do to ensure that um, the crimes they commit against people such as demonstrators of Black Lives Matter, et cetera, um, is stopped? Um, so I believe that the budget is absolutely bloated and it's because this city has come to rely on the NYPD to enforce um, social inequities and make them crimes. I've also have been defending protesters for decades, going back to the Occupy Wall Street. Um, I was part of the legal team when Trump banned Muslims in JFK Airport. And I've been on the front lines of the recent BLM protesters, including representing a protester pushed by an officer. And I'm the only one to have had that officer held accountable through criminal prosecutions. So that without a doubt is not something anybody would ever have to worry about. I'm not a candidate that comes from any particular office or organization. I'm beholden to the values of our community and I stand very strongly in ensuring those who hold positions of public trust are held to the highest standards of integrity. Um, what demonstrations have you um, participated in, be they, um, or marches, be, be they gay pride or black lives or um, abortion rights, or, um, protests against the president, et cetera? Oh, um, plenty of protests against the president going back to 2016, especially his attacks on immigrant rights and on New York City and, and attempting to tear us down. 
I recently joined the largest protest in defense of black trans lives in Brooklyn. And I've also been on the front line of many protests in favor of uh, pushing back on discrimination in any form. And my work as a civil rights attorney in defending against racial and religious discrimination and gender-based discrimination has been to always ensure that I shut that door of oppression when my case is done and that everyone across the border is protected from any forms of discrimination. Okay, a district attorney, I think in the Midwest, um, recently refused to um, treat a 20 year old as an adult and he would have gotten life in prison with the philosophy that somebody 20 years old, science dictates that their brain is not formed um, as an adult. Right. Other DAs, three DAs nearby objected. What's your viewpoint on that? I absolutely uh, would sign up for that and even go further. Again, um, these are children. Um, I don't believe in sentences more than 20 years. And if there is an occasion for a sentence of 20 years and older, I would uh, ensure parole at 10 years and would encourage the release at 10 years. But also our children need resources. Our communities need help. Uh, again, locking them up in a, a, a prison or a jail, which is only violent. I've had several clients stuck in Rikers that were assaulted and sexually assaulted and came out worse than when they went in. And we even see the case of Khalif Browder. That is the reality of incarcerating our children. They, it breaks them down and leaves absolutely no chance to reintegrate to society or become successful adults, not to mention the financial and emotional and mental damage that it does to the family and by extension, the community. Thank you very, very much. And um, we have to move on, appreciate it. We'll see you Thank soon. Thank you so much. Please people send in questions. Um, and I do want to thank um, Jeff Ferrant for putting together the, um, he's our resident um, Zoom person and our political director, Lewis Chaldon Brown, who spent many hours putting today together. Okay, next is our um, next candidate is Eliza or Orleans. Um, Eliza, are you on? I am. Okay, three minutes. Tell us who you are, um, why you think you merit the post, and then we'll go to questions. Okay, Alan, thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I wish we were all together in person. Um, as Alan said, I'm Eliza Orleans, and I have been a public defender here in Manhattan for the last 10 years. I've represented more than 3,000 people charged with crimes in this city, people who didn't have the money to pay for an attorney. And so every day in court, I've gone up against Cy Vance's office and against a criminal punishment bureaucracy that is cruel and unjust. One that is rigged for the rich and powerful and against everyone else. I remember my first year as a public defender, uh, nearly 11 years ago now, I saw our cruel, unjust criminal legal system operate. And I was angry and heartbroken and frustrated. I remember walking into night court one time and I met a man who I will call John, who was an assistant manager at a Gristides in Lower Manhattan, the same Gristides he'd worked at for 25 years. And the night before he had closed up the store, bought two bags of groceries with his employee discount to bring home to his family. And he walked over to the A train to prepare for his long ride home. He got on the subway, set the bags next to him on the uncrowded subway car and settled in. At the 125th Street stop, two uniformed NYPD officers got on the train, grabbed John's groceries, dumped them on the ground, and placed John in handcuffs, and then took him to jail for the night for the crime of occupying multiple seats on a transit facility. And I met him the next night, and I got him out of jail, but for 10 years, the frustration has never gone away. The heartbreak has never gone away, because in a decade of defending mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, people's children, people who otherwise couldn't afford an attorney and people who are jailed and bullied for as little as taking up two seats on the subway, I've come up against time and time again, a system that's designed to systematically disenfranchise so many. Black and brown people, lower income folks, LGBTQIA people, sex workers, those who are not powerful and not well connected. I often say it's not that the system is broken, the problem is it's working exactly as designed, exactly as a rigged system is supposed to, and disenfranchising the very people that it's designed to disenfranchise. 
but I know that we can do better and I know that we need this change. And we've seen it across the country in San Francisco, Philadelphia, and Boston. Now, personally, I never worked as a prosecutor and never aspired to be one. I've always fought against this system. But I realized that if we want to change the system, we have to change the DA. And this fight has never been more critical. And as the only public defender running for Manhattan District Attorney, you can be sure that I will bring bold transformational change and a vision for New York that is different from the status quo. And I look forward to serving as your next Manhattan District Attorney. Thank you very much. Um, sanctuary cities, what proposals will you advocate to protect immigrants and the undocumented? Um, and, and, to, and to secure us being a sanctuary city. Well, I've, you know, I've represented many, many people who've suffered from, you know, the severe consequences of the immigration issues that they're facing. And I've seen as, you know, the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has made their situation far worse, even on a case where a client I represented was offered a disorderly conduct. He then was, you know, taken into ICE custody and, and forcibly removed from this country, despite the fact that his wife was here, his children were here, and he'd been a taxpayer for over 30 years. I think, you know, we call ourselves a sanctuary city, and yet we don't do enough to protect the folks who are undocumented and who are immigrants here in, in our city. And so I would advocate for policies that take into account all of those things and, and push for, for truly being a sanctuary for all people. Okay, will you visit um, correctional facilities where um, your constituents are um, languishing? Of course. And will you course. issue a statement demanding that the governor start releasing the elderly who are at great risk with the coronavirus? Um, of course. It's very stingy. Okay. Absolutely, 100%. It's what I've always done. It's what I've advocated for. And I've visited my clients in jail for, for over a decade. Okay, and do you believe that the... Um, the criteria of remorse and rehabilitation is more important than the original crime, and you support the elder parole bill. Of course, I support the elder parole bill, and I think that the district attorney's office, you know, routinely, what I've seen with clients who, for whom I've written letters to the parole board advocating for their release, is what they do in every single case, and this is something that, you know, people who've never practiced as public defenders might not know, um, is that every single time they send a letter that says the Manhattan District Attorney's Office opposes the early release of inmate blank, fill in the person's name here. And it has taken so much advocacy and activism and, and pushing the DA's office to just not only not send that letter. So not only do I, would I abolish the policy of having it be the you know, blanket thing that they do in every case when a person is coming up for parole, but I would advocate for people's early release, um, especially in cases where there's been rehabilitation and remorse, et cetera, even though it shouldn't matter and we should be advocating for that regardless. Walking while well, trans bill and decrimin decrim of um, sexual activity, um, where, where money exchanges hands and where you work against the Nordic model that several legislators want to pass. Absolutely, 100%. I support full decriminalization of consensual sex work, and of course, you know, hoping that that Senator Hoylman's bill uh, to to abolish the walking while trans ban passes imminently. Okay. Will you hire formerly incarcerated people to work in your office, and hopefully, um, they would be able to visit people in the also in the penitent in the, in the correctional facilities to be able to report back to you. Of course, absolutely. I think that's critically important and, you know, have have sought their input on a, a number of things about my campaign because, you know, as much as I've represented, you know, thousands of people who've been incarcerated, I, you know, I think that having the lived experience of, of being incarcerated as an individual does uniquely situate you. And so I, I fully intend to hire those who've been formerly incarcerated. Okay. Have you marched in pride marches and what demonstrations or marches um, protests have you participated in and what have you done in the resist Trump movement? Alan, how much time do we have again? Um, I, I, I'm just, I've marched in pride um, all my life. I've been in the Queer Liberation March and um, Women's March, March for Our Lives, um, resisting Trump, um, you know, supported. I, I've been very active in protesting my entire adult life. Um, Black Lives Matter, you know, marches since um, for, for you know, over a handful of years, et cetera. Okay. Um, on the issue, last question, on the issues of um, um, requiring waivers of appeal and plea negotiation of felonies, 
in what situations you believe is, is appropriate, what type of crimes? So I actually don't think that waivers of appeal should be a condition of a plea under any circumstances. I think that that's extremely problematic um, because you're asking someone to, to waive their rights in order to get a certain deal. And I think that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has not only conditioned plea offers on waivers of appeal, but, but has threatened you know, these horrible trial penalties that we've seen over the years. Clients who wanted to challenge the constitutionality of a search or a seizure and even if they had gone forward to challenge the search, they were being, um, you know, threatened with a, a years-long prison sentence. And so, so I, I think that you know, there's a, a lot that needs to be done in in, in okay. all. Okay, we have to move on. We thank okay. you profusely, you. and we'll talk soon. Um, is our next candidate here, um, Tali um, um, Fahadia Weinstein? Okay, she's not here yet. We switched her around. So um, is Alvin Bragg here? Alvin Bragg. Okay, I will text them. Jano Smartin. Not, uh, um, Dan Court. Liz Crotty. Okay, I guess we're a little bit ahead of time. So um, they'll be on momentarily, I am certain. Um, so the floor is open if there are kinds of questions you or different wavelengths that you think we should be on with some of the candidates or if you think there's follow-ups we need. Oh, Liz Crotty, are you on? Okay. I, I am on. You are. Okay, then we're going to give the floor to you. Um, Three-minute presentation and then we'll go to questions and answers. Hi, thank you so much for having me tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak with you. Um, I, I have uh, come to enter the DA's race. I have a unique perspective here in that I have been, I started in the Manhattan DA's office in 2000. I was a DA for six years. Um, I then went to a private firm for two years and I started my own business, my own practice 12 years ago. I've been a criminal defense attorney for 12 years. Um, in that time, I have really seen where people have uh, the DA's office has lost its way. I think that we can get back to where we need to be, where defendants get a fair shot, uh, victims get the, the um, safety, and everyone can kind of live together. I think that this comes to me as a New Yorker. I'm born and raised in New York City, um, in, from Stuyvesant Town, went to school, uh, went to law school here. Um, and I really feel as though that my perspective and my experience will bring a lot to the DA's office of knowing to make meaningful change, not just lip service. Our past DA, he campaigned 10 years ago on, on uh, open discovery. I've been in the building for 10 years. It didn't happen until the legislature started. So legislation passed. So I think these are the things that I can bring to in a sense of real practicality to everything. And that is why I'm running for Manhattan DA. Okay, thank you very much. We got a very good question here regarding the DNA unit. Um, would you would you, su you support Senator Hoyleman's bill to shut down the city's rogue DNA index, um, especially um, crimes, um, people who commit, are committed of crimes and children, um, keep the children out of the city's unregulated DNA index? I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. I do know that if you have it, the DNA has been the most effective in sex crimes unit. And when there's rape kits done, and then the DNA links the people back to rape kits. So I would support saving some sort forms of, D, of DNA. It has always been a, a question to me why people who have a simple assault case and certain cases why they need to give DA, I would definitely, uh, DNA, I would definitely look at the different crimes charged um, and decide from there whether DNA was appropriate in that. So low level crimes and unless it's really necessary, you won't um, work with the DNA unit. Yeah. Okay, um, walking while trans and the um, decriminalization of, of sex work. Um, well yeah, I, as, as I've been a defense attorney now for 12 years, uh, loitering for prostitution is very, very rarely even as an arrest made. I have represented um, people who make their living doing sex work. Uh, they are nice, uh, nice people who are want to be productive uh, citizens of New York City. I support decriminalizing 
um, prostitution. I think that uh, sorry, I got a phone call. Sorry, I had to demute that. Uh, I and and so I su I support uh, the decriminalization of sex work. Okay, um, thank you. Will you be visiting people in uh, correctional facilities who are asking for parole and don't think they've been given an even shot? And will you have a staff member specifically assigned to um, investigating how to get people out who no longer belong in prison, specifically the elderly? Well, I, I as a defense attorney, I go, to, I go to prisons now. So I don't see, I mean, if the, the circumstances mandated it, yes, I would go. Okay, solitary confinement. I'm against solitary confinement. Doesn't seem to be effective. Okay, and Sanctuary City, what proposals will you advocate to protect the immigrants and further New York as a sanctuary city? I think sanctuary cities are important. I have represented undocumented illegal immigrants before, and I think that, that they need to be protected in for, and also going, coming forward as victims of crime and being comfortable to know that if they come forward as a victim of a crime, that they will be protected. I also think that there has to be a institu institutionalization, excuse me, institutionalizing U visas for victims of crime so that they can easily access them. It's, it's there and it's available, but it's very hard to get. As sanctuary cities, I mean, one of my, anecdotally, one of my most favorite things that I've done is I do uh, volunteer at the Elizabeth detention center, getting people ready for their credible fear interviews when they come here seeking asylum. I think um, immigration is kind of the lifeblood of not only this country, but of New York City. And I think that we need to protect it as we go forward. Okay, um, what press conferences, well, what, what's been your tie with the LGBTQ community, be it um, pre, um, pride or what issues have you been involved in and what other kinds of marches or um, resist movement, specifically the resist Trump movement, have you been active in? Well, I'm a great friend of the LBQT community. Um, I have been going to Pride for quite some time. Um, I have to admit it, admit that I haven't been to Pride in the past few years, but in my 20s and 30s, it almost replaced St. Patrick's Day in terms of a day for, for celebration. Um, I have supported AMFAR and the center on 13th Street. Um, and anecdotally, again, one of the greatest highlights of 2019 was marrying my best friend and his husband and acting as the officiant in the wedding. So I, I have always seen myself, I, and on top of that, I have participated in the Women's March, I have protested, I have gone to Black Lives Matter. I think these are all important issues of the day. Okay, the district attorney in Philadelphia um, cleaned the house of the career prosecutors um, those who wouldn't change their philosophy, and many of them quit. Um, would you be bringing legal aid attorneys and those who have been fighting on the other side for justice for the people who are um, being accused? I think, I think the office needs a, a, a bunch of different perspectives. I think the people who are career prosecutors in the Manhattan DA's office, who I know, who I continue to work with, they are dedicated public servants. Um, and I think people who are in legal aid and public defenders and private defenders are also believers in the system and they want the system to work correctly. So I think having a mix of those perspectives will guarantee a fuller perspective into, into the office. Defund the police. Do you believe the police um, budget is bloated? And how will you hold police accountable who mistreat protesters, et cetera, and commit crimes against people? Well, that, that's a big question. It's not really a, a three part question. I think in terms of defunding the police, I think the thing that's coming up now is which neighborhood would you want to start defunding the police in? I think that you have to think more of reallocating and demilitarizing and working with community involvement. I think that if the police commit crimes, they should definitely be held accountable just as anybody else should be accountable. Uh, but I do think in defunding the police, I think that you really have to think more about reallocating community outreach, how are police trained, and then where does the budget fall into that? But I think as defunding the police, I think we really have to think of it in those terms. Okay, um, we're about out of time. Um, we thank you very, very much for appearing before us. And as you know, we'll be making our endorsement before petitioning. And you got a questionnaire, which we asked to be returned in mid-September. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. I appreciate Thank the you. opportunity. 
Um, our next candidate I see is on um, Lucy Lang. I saw you a minute ago. Lucy, are you there? Hi, Alan. There you are. Okay, three Hi, minutes of presentation, and then we're going to go to questions and answers. Welcome aboard. Thanks so much for having me, Alan. I'm really glad to be with you all tonight. We all know that our city thrives most when each of us is treated with dignity. And as a criminal justice reform leader and former assistant district attorney, I recognize that the role of the district attorney requires more than prosecution. It requires deep consideration of communities, all kinds of communities. It requires prevention and it requires rehabilitation. We're at a transformational moment in criminal justice in New York City and nationally. My campaign is focused on three core values, dignity, equity, and safety. The crime survivors, their families, and the incarcerated students I have worked with have taught me that community-based solutions and restorative justice are vital to addressing trauma, preserving dignity, and making our city healthy and safe. So I'm running for district attorney to realize the full potential of what a district attorney can do. To that end, I support the decriminalization of sex work. We should not criminalize bodies, and that includes people who patronize sex workers. I support record relief legislation to expand relief to victims of trafficking who are saddled with criminal records. I support the walking while trans legislation. I support the establishment of supervised drug consumption sites. I support the elder parole bill. I'm a strong ally of the LGBTQ community as head of the Institute for Innovation and Prosecution at John Jay College. I ensured that the LGBTQ plus community was represented on our staff and just last month, I hosted a panel discussion on prosecution and issues specific to the LGBTQ plus communities, which included leading voices on the issue from across the country. I collaborated closely with LGBTQ members of the district attorney's office while I was there and while I was working on issues nationally. A senior member of my campaign staff is an LGBTQ plus community member, and I pledge to having LGBTQ plus voices on my transition team and including LGBTQ plus people in senior leadership positions in my administration. I'll also add that having spent the past several years teaching a class that I created in New York State Prison that brings assistant district attorneys alongside incarcerated students to study criminal justice together, I pledge to include directly impacted voices in every step of decision making as district attorney. My current kitchen cabinet for my campaign and closest advisors include people who have been through the system. And I know firsthand the importance of having those voices at the table, which will be a top priority for me as district attorney. Thank you. It's going to be very difficult to ask you questions because you answered most of them. Um, um, so we thank you for that. Um, we, uh, you're, as, okay, the elder parole bill, uh, 55 years or older, spent 15 years in prison. Um, do you support that? That's the Brad Harmon bill. I absolutely do, Alan. Some of my students who are nearing the end of very long prison sentences have spent upwards of 25 years in prison. And invariably to a person, they say, I did something terrible and I regret it and I didn't need to be here this long. We really need to revisit the length of sentences in New York. Okay, you know, we worked very hard to get Judith Clark out of uh, Bedford after 38 years. Um, the Manhattan DA who knew Judith because um, from the puppy program refused to speak up. Yet the DA in Brooklyn went to visit Judith the Monday before the, um, her um, parole hearing. I accompanied him. Um, would you be the kind of DA that would go and let the parole board know that these people should be out? I absolutely like see Judith. the district absolutely see the district attorney's role as advocating for people who aren't clemency and parole. Yes. Okay. Um, do you, um, you affirmatively um, agree to hire incarcerated people in your office to, um, to sit in on high level meetings when they discuss um, sentencing? I certainly do. I think that it's mission critical to building a diverse workforce that speaks directly to the community. Okay, the DNA issue. Um, we have a legal aid lawyer who raises the issue about the unregulated um, DNA index um, for children and others where they get put into the system. Um, what's your feeling on that? I think that we have overextended the use of DNA 
but of course it is vital to solving some of the most dangerous crimes in our city. So I think that our DNA practices could be audited by an outside agency to assess whether it's appropriate uh, when we're gathering DNA, how it's being used, and how long it's being stored. Okay, the present DA during discussions I've had with him um, has expressed um, um, reservations about taking on the police because he has to have a working relationship with them, regardless of the fact that the issues that we're asking him to take on were legitimate concerns. What will be your concern? Would it be more important to work with the left-wing community and civil rights activists, even if the police department is going to get angry at you? I'm really glad you raised that, Alan. Thank you. Just this morning, I joined Communities United for Police Reform down at Foley Square to speak out against the injunction on the repeal of 50A, the law that prevents disclosure of police misconduct records. The nation and the city are collectively demanding police reform and accountability. The demands are totally real and justified, and our leadership has to listen. Law enforcement, whether police or prosecutors, have to be held to the highest standards. I spent the past two years working with family members who lost loved ones to police violence, with police chiefs and with prosecutors from around the country to develop a set of protocols and best practices to ensure that officers are appropriately investigated and held accountable in instances of violence. That extends beyond just outright fatalities. It includes how prosecutors can help elevate the culture of policing nationwide. And I am absolutely committed to transformative change that protects our communities, even when it means keeping police officers out of them. I consider policies like eliminating the prosecution of low-level offenses to help minimize the contact police have with communities as a strategy that helps support the kind of reform that we're talking about. Okay. Um, by the way, um, Manhattan Borough President um, Gail Brewer has joined us. Welcome, Gail. Thank you for coming. Okay. Um, what would you do about, um, you know, victimless crimes such as um, two people are arrested for um, having sex with an exchange of money. Do you throw the case out or, um, or what? What do you do? Do you prosecute it or do you take a stand? If you're referring to cases of two consensual adults, I see no need to prosecute those cases, no. Okay, great. And what will you do to protect New York as a sanctuary city? And what would you do to protect the undocumented from ICE and the fascist administration in the White House? I had the privilege to co-author with the late Robert Morgenthau the last editorial that he wrote before he passed last summer, which was advocating to keep ICE out of courthouses. Just last week, I published a piece um, in support of, or rather in opposition to the Trump administration's outrageous withholding of U visas for crime victims. I think that one of the most important things that prosecutors can do is to ensure that victims, especially our most vulnerable victims, including immigrant communities, have access to the protections of the law. And I would absolutely use the full power of the office to ensure that all communities, but in particular immigrant communities, are protected and able to access justice. Last question from Brian Romero, an excellent question. Would you not join the, the District Attorney's Association of the State of New York due to them being so conservative and um, not um, reform-minded? That's a good question, Brian. I have to say that my own view of change is that a diversity of voices at the table makes a tremendous difference. And I think that as a forward-thinking, innovative, progressive prosecutor, it is very useful to the state to have people with a range of political views at the table. So my inclination as I sit here now, Brian, is that I would join and try to help bring the rest of the state along to where I think that not just New York City, but the whole state needs to be in terms of prosecutorial philosophy. But I'm certainly willing to revisit that depending on how things evolve. Okay, very last question. I'm getting a lot of questions now. Thank you, everybody. What's your um, position on actually defunding the police and um, shrinking their budget? Would this be something you would speak out on? Where would you make the cuts? I'm strongly in favor of a commu coordinated community response to a range of conduct that doesn't rise to the level of criminality. I think that far too often, New Yorkers and others are forced to avail themselves of the police force because we don't have alternatives. So I am 
am absolutely in favor of removing resources from the police department and diverting them towards pro-social community-based organizations that can respond in crisis when there is not an imminent danger. Okay, thank you. And by the way, all of you candidates who are on, we encourage you all to go to Washington on the 28th. It's the 57th anniversary of the I Had a Dream speech, and it's being sponsored by Martin Luther King Jr. and um, Al Sharpton. And I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much, Lu uh, Lucy. And I Thank you, Alan. Great to see you. Is on. Alvin, it seems as though I only see you online. Um, welcome aboard. You have three minutes to do a presentation and um, tell us who you are, why you think we should support you. And then we'll go on to questions and answers. You have a total of 20 minutes, so three minutes now. Thank you. Great. Thank, thanks, thanks so much. So happy to be with the club and see you again uh, electronically. Uh, let me just start by saying why I got into criminal justice work. I was a 15-year-old boy in Harlem uh, walking to the corner store for my dad at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic, uh, and three undercover officers uh, came up on me, put guns in my faces, guns in my face, claimed I was a drug dealer, uh, and that was my first interaction with the criminal justice system. Uh, you know, sadly, that happened again countless times, uh, two other times at gunpoint. That's why I went to law school. Uh, I left Harlem, went off to Harvard for college and law school, and came back and got right to work. I started as a civil rights lawyer and a criminal defense lawyer. I became a federal prosecutor uh, focused on public corruption. Uh, then I went to the attorney general's office and ultimately became the chief deputy attorney general overseeing a staff of 1,200. Uh, and there I was proud to you know, lead cases, uh, suing Trump uh, for his fraud with the Trump Foundation, suing Harvey Weinstein for having a hostile work environment, uh, standing up for uh, tenants, prosecuting landlords, who harassed tenants out of their homes, uh, prosecuting employers who uh, paid unlawfully and criminally low wages to their workers, uh, and standing side by side and up for uh, survivors of a violent crime. Throughout it all, a uh, thread for me has been focused on police accountability, which, as I said, is why I got into this work. Uh, my very first case was a lawsuit against the state police for excessive force breaking up a uh, political uh, protest. Uh, here we are again, some 20 years later, dealing with the exact same thing. Uh, when I was a federal prosecutor, I tried and convicted an FBI agent who lied uh, and obstructed justice. When I was at the Attorney General's office, I prosecuted a sitting district attorney who tanked a case to take an investigation uh, of an officer who shot at eight times and killed an unarmed black motorist. Uh, and just uh, last week, I was in court uh, representing members of the Garner family in an action we brought against the city, seeking transparency and details, still six plus year later, years later, about his death. So that's uh, my work that I've done uh, every step of the way. I, I know you're going to hear from great candidates tonight. Uh, I would respectfully submit that uh, I have a unique blend of personal and professional experience. You know, someone who has, uh, you know, posted bail for family and friends and help them navigate the system. And then inside the system, reform the bail system when I was at the Attorney General's office, our own practices. Uh, you know, someone who's sat across the dinner table from a, a loved one who was in solitary confinement uh, and then went on to sue uh, Nassau County for its own uh, prison conditions. Uh, started out uh, myself, you know, not just the police pointing guns in my face, but uh, many of you will recall 1980s Harlem. I had many other violent encounters with people who were not police, uh, and then to go on from that work to stand side by side uh, with survivors of crime. Th this is my life. Uh, this is my life's work. It's led me to a vision of the criminal justice system that I would take to the DA's office that would uh, make incarceration a matter of last resort, that would uh, prioritize reentry as relative who was in solitary confinement came to live with him for a year after he was released from prison that would completely over if somebody doesn't somehow isn't muted okay um we have a bunch of questions let me ask you some uh, very yes or no questions um do you support um decriminalizing um decrims of sex work and would you oppose the nordic model so i would definitely not prosecute uh, any consensual sex, I'm, I'm still looking at the specific bill that's in front of the legislature. 
Okay, um, could, could you get back to me on that? And I want to share that. It's in your questionnaire, so hopefully you'll be able to, to, um, to answer that. Will you visit um, correctional facilities and um, visit people who have applied for parole when, um, when you believe that um, it should be granted? Definitely. Okay, you're off, did you say you work for um, Tish James or Eric Schneiderman? I worked for the uh, Eric Schneiderman, Barbara Underwood. Uh, I left at the end of the Barbara okay. Underwood tenure. Very briefly, Barbara Underwood is the, the force, the one person that refused to allow Judith Clark out. When um, the parole board committed um, an infraction um, and illegally did not release um, Judith Clark, um, it was Barbara Underwood. Um, and since then, um, Tish James um, defends the parole board in each and every time that they don't let somebody out, even when it's unreasonable to do so. What is your philosophy on people getting out? Do you support the elder parole board? And do you believe that the remorse and retribution is paramount over the crime that may have been committed 20, 30 years ago? I think you just put it very appropriately and well. I definitely agree with what you said. We've got a lot of respect for, for Barbara Underwood. I work with her on a number of issues, but I disagree with her. Uh, I, I didn't see the exact position for, on that matter, but to the extent she disagreed with what you just said, uh, I agree with what you said. I think we've got an overly punitive system and a broken uh, probation, and I would say also parole system. And as district attorney, I would continue to be outspoken on that uh, and seek reforms. What task forces within your office would you abolish and what would you create off the top? So I would, I would have an independent police accountability civil rights unit that did not, does not do work on any other cases with the NYPD so we can have uh, independence. Uh, that's number one. I would completely overhaul uh, the sex crimes unit, which I think uh, has been sort of exhibit A for uh, the incumbents having two systems of justice. Those are two right off the bat that I would re reform. I would integrate into the office. Now they're sort of off to the side, but reentry, which I mentioned in my opening remarks, um, and then also probation and parole. I mean, right now the DA's office is, you know, to the extent they're get involved is not a force for, for change in those areas. I would change the model, integrate and retrain ADA so that they're thinking about reentry issues from the beginning and are active in probation and parole issues uh, to, to make, making leniency our default position uh, so we can get folks back home and back members of the community. Okay, um, plea bargains. Um, everybody knows that people um, often plea bargain because it's like Russian roulette. Even if they're not guilty, um, they have to, um, you know, r risk a long sentence or plead guilty to a crime they didn't commit. How would you deal with that? So the very first fundamental way I deal with that is, uh, I plan to prosecute, prosecute a lot fewer crimes. I mean, I think right now, you know, what we're doing, the scope of our system, we got police involved in social distancing enforcement, homeless sweeps, uh, you know, all kinds of minor things. So w one concern that the DAs of often raise is that they're swamped and they need to uh, uh, engage in coercive plea bargaining. My model uh, would have a system that has a lot fewer cases and focused on uh, doing cases that actually make us safer. And I think that uh, would get rid of the argument that DAs must rely on sort of coercive uh, a, a plea bargaining. Okay, what is your relationship um, historically with the LGBT community? And have you um, taken a part in any demonstrations or the resistance movement against the fascists in the White House? Yes, well, so I think uh, traditionally a strong uh, relationship with the LGBT community doing you know, you know, work uh, you know, we investigated uh, companies at the AG's office uh, and proved companies that uh, were violating kind of post-Windsor, the law on uh, equal uh, health healthcare benefits for same-sex uh, uh, married couples. Uh, we did work on that. Uh, speaking of the, 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 the person in the White House, you know, we sued him over 100 times when I was at the AG's office. And one that I'm, I'm, I'm most proud of is our work fighting back against his really pernicious evil rule uh, that would uh, say, quote unquote, uh, allow healthcare workers to rely on, I guess I should have the quotes, around moral and religious uh, grounds to refuse treatment. Uh, and, you know, that was an action, you know, targeted at a number of communities, but most pointedly at the LGBTQ community. So I was proud to, to, to fight in court 
against the administration on many fronts, but specifically on that. Uh, and yes, I've been uh, a, a part of uh, the protest movement since I was a, a kid in high school, uh, protesting uh, targeted malt liquor and cigarette ads at youth in Harlem, uh, then followed by Rodney King, right on up to obviously the last few months fighting in, in, in the streets for change, which I think we've seen direct impact almost immediately uh, in our legislature. Okay, we've got some um, questions here. Um, the legis um, Hundreds of folks were arrested um, for looting during the George Floyd protests and charged with burglary three. If you were DA, what would you direct your assistance to do with these cases? Uh, not prosecuting any uh, peaceful protesters. Um, would want to look at the specific facts of some. If there was obviously physical harm to someone, an actual person, uh, uh, I, would, I would look closely and, and, and do that subset of cases. But as a general matter, my default would not be to prosecute those cases. Okay, and what about misconduct with the police? Um, how would you deal with that? Um, now it goes before the Civilian Complaint Re um, Review Board, which um, is not revolutionary. Um, what would you do for misconduct and what would you do with violence perpetuated by the armed forces of New York um, the police department? I do what I've been doing the last 20 years. Uh, you know, I mentioned a couple of prosecutions in my, in my uh, remarks, prosecuting a district attorney who tanked one of these cases, prosecuting an FBI agent. Uh, obviously, I think by the time any of us would be in office, uh, the attorney general will have jurisdiction over deaths, force that result in deaths, but we have excessive force that, res that results in less than death that we need to treat very seriously. I would prioritize those cases. Uh, and I would also, and again, this is using an independent uh, new unit I'd have in the office that does not do cases with the NYPD. I would also take a very strong look at, at, at testa lying. Um, the, the case I did against the FBI agent was a lying case. And when police officers lie, it fundamentally undermines the administration of justice. So in addition to force, I'd be looking to uh, aggressively and actively police lying. Okay, um, on defunding the police and their budget, um, would you take a position on that? Definitely, I have taken a position. I offer the opinion. I stood with uh, uh, Communities United for Police Reform and, and the others who are protesting uh, for a rollback in the $1 billion uh, budget, uh, which would undo uh, de Blasio's uh, bloating of the NYPD. Um, and I mentioned a few areas specifically. I mean, I think the NYPD being involved in social distancing enforcement uh, was uh, unjust. We saw the disparities between um, black and brown communities and white communities. Uh, in particular on that, I think homelessness and the sweeps should not be under the purview of the NYPD. My dad used to run homeless shelters. We, ha we have people who know how to uh, address those issues from a social service perspective. Uh, and then also obviously a, a matter of uh, concern was the, the, the funny budget math on police in schools. Uh, when I was at the Attorney General's office, we investigated uh, two school departments upstate uh, and shifted them from uh, the kind of model we have in the NYPD now to something okay. different. Two so, more, and please keep your answers brief because we have to move on. Um, would you, re very good question, will you refuse to accept money from real estate on any entities that are well known for um, contributing to um, Donald Trump and the White House, specifically people like um, Steve Ross? Would you refuse money from related and people like all real estate? So I, I don't have an absolute real estate ban. I'm not taking money from corporations. People have matters in front of the DA's office. Um, and I, I don't think anyone who supported Donald Trump will be supporting me. We haven't had a per se rule on that, but we're certainly not seeking that money. And anyone who knows my record, they're not contributing to me. Uh, specifically, Steve Ross, we're going to keep an eye on that. And um, lastly, um, there was a prosecutor in, uh, I believe, the Midwest that refused um, to um, give a life sentence to, to somebody who was 20 years old. She said that anybody under 21, science proves that the brain is not function, is not fully grown. So even though the law in New York allows um, youth to be tried as adults, would you not prosecute people under 21 as adults? I, I agree with the science on that. And, and I, I guess I, I, my plan would not be to. I, the, the age I'd really been thinking about was 18. So I've, but I think the same reasoning would apply between 18 and 21. Okay, great. 
Thank you very, very much. And we'll be in touch. You've got a questionnaire, um, which we will send everybody and um, post. Um, so we thank you. I hope to see you in Washington on the 28th. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Um, is there, you're not running for DA, Eric, you're running for council. Okay. Um, um, is there another candidate on yet? Um, we have several candidates that we are waiting for. Um, I'm um, Ms. Weinberg, Janice Martin, and um, Dan Court. Let me see if any of them are on yet. I'm getting your questions, and I've been asking the vast majority of them. Some of them you people refer to legislation, and I'm not familiar with it, so I wouldn't know what I'm asking necessarily. So if you could be um, clearer on what you're asking, doing the topic instead of the, the legislation number, it would be helpful to me. Brian Romero gave me initials for something I'm quite familiar with, but I did not know what the, those initials, um, I didn't connect what it stood for. Um, so try to help me there. Um, and if anybody wants to say something, we'll take you off mute um, until another candidate comes. I see JJ Kelly's on, Supreme Court Justice. Thank you, JJ, for being on. Um, um, okay, we just have to wait a few minutes. Um, sorry about that. Um, yeah. Alan, I don't want to be presumptuous, but you said if anyone wants to talk. I, yes. I, I, so so uh, as I was logging on, I heard the last candidate talking about immigration issues, and I, I wasn't asked about that. I just wanted to mention that was that's Great. a very particular focus for me. Sanctuary cities, again, shortly after Trump was elected, we put out a, a, a plan at the Attorney General's office and we've been policing that space. We were when I was there. Um, and then also in other areas, obviously we sued over the citizenship question on the census. It's a, just a fundamentally important uh, issue, the way we treat our immigrants uh, and the, the, the White House's position in trying to force that down city's throats would really undermine, uh, would, be, would not be fair, would also just undermine justice and the, the way we, we uh, approach things here. So I just wanted to note that since I wasn't okay, asked. I'll allow other candidates who spoke already, but I do want to ask you, will you send a letter and send us a copy to um, the Attorney General asking her to stop automatically defending the parole board when they don't release people, but to take it on a case by case? Uh, I will, I will, I had not thought about writing. I actually have a two-year bar as a person who's left the attorney general's office where I cannot advocate directly okay. to the AG's office. So I, I think I may not be able to do it under the state ethics rules, but uh, there may be more informal ways that I can, you know, maybe speak out publicly and the attorney general will see something like that. Thank you. And I'll come back to you in a year and a half for that letter. Um, any of the other candidates? Yes, um, Tahani. Yeah, um, one thing that I wanted to mention is when we talked about holding officers accountable specifically in regards to their actions to protesters. Um, as the DA's office, we come in after the fact where there's police and NYPD misconduct. The strength in our office is something that I've actually done now as a candidate is one, advocate for the Manhattan DA to decline to prosecute disorderly conduct charges. I'm now working to pressure the Manhattan DA and DAs across the city to decline to prosecute um, violations of the mayor's curfew uh, citations that were written um, and plenty of other um, charges that really are a pay to protest charge. And this by extension goes to advocating for um, stopping court fines and fees uh, that are exorbitant amounts of money, trigger warrants and keep people constantly dragged back into the system um, because of means beyond their control. And it goes back to criminalizing poverty and social inequities. So that's how the DA's office can differentiate itself from the NYPD and become a leader in not only standing with the people, but putting the NYPD back in their place. I think that's a very important thing to always think in terms of 
How is the DA going to be independent, further values that strengthen its um, relationship directly with the community? And to that point, we haven't really talked about it too much, but, but for victims of crimes, especially sexual assault, in my experience, um, it's been very difficult to get the ear of ADAs and NYPD to take reports. So one thing I'm going to establish is a direct line of access for victims of sexual assaults to the DA's office. And what that will do is give them uh, an ear beyond the NYPD um, who typically tries to discredit victims or find ways to excuse the behavior of not following through with reports. And so that's also a, um, another avenue I plan to pursue to, again, make sure that the DA's office is independent, that the public and the community has access to the office and its resources, um, and uh, take part in the decision making of the criminal justice system. Okay, thank you. I see, thank you very much. And I see Hi. that State Senator um, Robert Jackson has been on. Hello, Bob, Robert. Robert saved us from the IDC. We owe you for that. Thank you. Um, Alan, I have something to add that it's a question that went to other candidates, but I wasn't asked. Um, and that was with regards to um, DASNY. And I think we all know that DASNY was one of the biggest roadblocks to seeing real criminal justice reform uh, making its way through the state legislature here in New York. And DASNY has been a lobbying group and they have really been absolutely awful. So I would pledge to withdraw from DASNY and would not want to be associated in any way with the District Attorney, Attorney Association um, for the state of New York. Um, can you answer that to um, Alvin and um, to Hani? Sure. Uh, so the last time I was a member of the uh, DA's association was when I was at the AG's office and I sued the DA of Rensselaer County uh, and then prosecuted the DA of Rensselaer County. That, that case is set to go to trial in September. Uh, so I've got a sort of an adversarial relationship, but I believe we pushed them in, in some important areas. There were some members of the DA's association that started doing reports uh, about uh, issues that we thought were important. So I, I do not support almost any of the positions that they hold, but I would like to continue to, as uh, John Lewis would say, do good trouble, but do it from within. And I think I have no uh, concern, and others have a concern about me being co-opted since okay. last time I was there, I sued and prosecuted one of the members, which I can assure you. It's, it's uh, meant more than that just being co-opted, it's, it's joining a, a right, um, a conservative organization, and you should consider, you know, not doing that. Um, Okay, and Tahani, you want? No, I'm, I, I am the antithesis of a group like that. Uh, as a woman of color, as someone that comes from the directly impacted community, someone that has called for um, prosecutorial accountability, for police accountability, that has actively sued the NYPD, changed the patrol guide, held DAs accountable. Um, I wouldn't be welcome there if I wanted to be. I definitely would not be part of it. Um, but I've spent a lot of my life being shut out of groups and clubs like that, um, not to my detriment. I don't think you need to join that club to make the reforms. The power is with the people, the power is with the impacted community, and that's what real justice is about. We're not here to reform and tweak and give thoughts and prayers. We're here to overhaul. Okay. Um, while we're talking about um, other district attorneys, um, when we endeavored to get Judith Clark out, one of the problems we encountered with, with at least one other DA, I'm not gonna mention Cy Vance's name, um, was that the district attorney where the crime was committed um, was against her getting out. So DAs often you know, give deference to the DA where the crime was committed. That didn't stop Eric Gonzalez from going to Bedford. Um, would a, that kind of deference stop you from, from doing what your conscience dictates? Would you take on another DA, um, if, if, like an instance like Judith Clark? As a question, definitely. I'm sorry, Alvin, and then Tahani, and then Eliza. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, definitely, without hesitation. I've done it before, and I would do it again. You got to stand up for justice. And, and Liz Crotty, I'm sorry. Why don't we go to Tahani, Eliza, and Liz Crowley? 
Yeah, absolutely. I think it's always time to do the right thing. And, and uh, for me, in running this campaign, I'm pursuing justice for all. So it's regardless of, of who's in charge, we're talking about the injustice. Okay, Eliza? I wouldn't hesitate for a second. I've gone up against DAs my entire career and would continue to do so. And I've spoken out about a number of the cases that have been decided by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and I think would, would certainly continue that trend. Liz Craddock, you're on mute. Let me take you off on mute. Nope, just, Jeff. Sorry, okay. am I unmuted? Okay, sorry. I think having disagreement is, is how you get, get better results. I think the disagreement is part of how you, you move things forward. And I think disagreement is a natural process for how you come to the right answer. I think getting Judith Clark out was great, but I think that the fact of the matter is, is that there's lots of other people who are elderly who get out. Judith Clark had a very specific set of circumstances. She was a white, well-to-do woman who was part of a conspiracy that had an unfortunate end, and she had paid her head. She'd become the model citizen. There are other people in jail who are like that. And I think that you have to look at the black and brown communities who are in there who no one's paying attention to, who don't have well-connected friends. And I think that that's where you kind of come in and say, where are we going? What are we doing? How are we fighting for everyone? And I Liz, think- if I may, <laughs> if I may, Judith Clark was a symbol. Roz Smith, who's on our board, was a black woman who spent more time at Bedford than um, Judith Clark. And we worked very hard to get her out. And she got out because of Eric Gonzalez. It has not been um, um, only Judith Clark that we worked for. I began with Judith Clark because I was asked by a friend of hers. But we recently went up and picketed at Sing Sing. And a few weeks ago, we also did Bedford and Otisville because the governor's not letting people out and it's mostly people of color. So Judith, that we just brought up as a for instance, but we're working on specifically people of color um, and um, everyone else. And I, there are many people who have written us letters, people of color, thanking us for our efforts. So not just about Judith, but thank you. And Diana Florence, did you want to say something? Sure, yes. I mean, I, what I think is it's really important to, uh, to work together and figure out what justice is. And if, in fact, if justice is releasing someone like Judith Clark, that's important. But I want to talk a little bit about what I did to collaborate and actually bring other DAs to more progressive issues. When I was the leader of the construction fraud task force, I recognized that wage theft is not a crime that happens just within a county. And a lot of construction fraud is like that. So I actually actively uh, went across state, uh, county lines and upstate, even across city lines, to work together with other DAs, all the way up to Ithaca, to encourage them that wage theft is a crime. We steal a you know a thousand dollar iPhone. That's considered a crime, and and we've sent black and brown people uh, to jail for that. But for too long, it's been con wage theft is considered something that is civil, and yet it has much more corrosive effects. So what I wanted to say is I worked to actually convince other DAs to re-examine what it means to be a crime. And actually, I spearheaded a wage theft initiative in December of 2017, where we didn't just bring the big cases. The big cases are great, and it's great to investigate and bring them, but it's also really important to bring those small cases, because the reality is, you know, the theft of a $300 paycheck can mean the difference between being able to pay your rent or feed your family. So we need to be thinking more about what's a, what's a crime. This is the 21st century. We can't be doing things the same old way. That's what I did. And that's the way I would work uh, beyond the county. Manhattan is the most, uh, as you said at the top of, the, uh, of the, this session, it is the most um, um, important DA's office, I believe, in the country. And we can set things. And we can start things here. And it spread. It's what happened when I was construction fraud task force. And I think that's incumbent on what we need to be doing. OK, while we're waiting for the next candidate, could you all answer whether or not you support abolishing mandatory minimums? I do. OK, Eliza? Absolutely. Tahani? 
Yeah, I, absolutely. I think that um, to automatically designate someone into a, a sentence in the in the prison <clears throat> industrial complex and subject them to the violence that occurs there as just something automatic does nothing to serve and respond to the social inequities or address the underlying root causes of the behavior. Lucy? Alan, I do think we should abolish mandatory minimums. And I also want to raise the issue of mandatory persistent violent felony status, which is essentially New York State's three strikes law. And far too often we use that law or one of the corollary laws as a way to get unduly harsh sentences against people who really need help and support. So I would advocate against the use of that statute for elevating sentences. Okay, um, and Liz Pr Prady. Uh, you know, actually, uh, mandatory minimums only really exist for violent crimes and extreme theft. There, you're up to not, you're not, a, there's no mandatory minimum uh, on, except for a, a, up to a C, A, B, and C felonies. It's a little bit inside baseball. But I think when you have, I think that the question really should be, if you can prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt and you get a verdict, then there then there, it's a jail substantive defense. And I'm sorry, but I mean, it's a little unpopular with this group of people, but when people commit crimes, their jails exist for a reason and some people do have to go. So I think that you have to, to think about those things and indeterminate sentences only, ex mandatory minimums only exist on a very select amount of, of crimes and I don't think they should be abolished. So in instances, you, you don't think that um, individual circumstances or instances that led the person to commit the crime should be considered in the, in the, um, the sentence and maybe what? someone merits a, a small, a, a less of a sentence because of the circumstances. No, but what I think is, is that people, first of all, you have to, when you are the DA, you have to look at the case as a whole perspective. And when you look at the case as a whole perspective, it goes into charging decisions. And if you're going to charge and the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt, and you think you can charge all of these things in a legitimate way, that these things happened in A, B, and C felonies, then you're taking that case. Then if there's mandatory minimums, it doesn't come down to what is what are the consequences and the collateral things? I mean, we're not talking about a drug case. Drug cases, it's an it's a mandatory sentence on an A1 drug case. That means that those are key lows of crime. Those are people who are at the top. Those are people who are distributing to all of Manhattan. They are the, the kingpins of, of the operation, not somebody who's selling drugs on it on an E, on a D, and on a C nonviolent. There's no mandatory minimum. So that person is not going to jail. So it's really not that kind of question. So I think that you have to, you have to really think about where you charge and how you charge these cases, not what, what, what the stand should be on mandatory minimums. Uh, Alan, this is Alan Bragg. I didn't have a chance to respond. Yeah. I, I'm absolutely opposed and I've seen the effect firsthand of these mandatory minimums in my neighborhood in Harlem uh, growing up and now. So I'm absolutely opposed to them. Okay, we got, um... Uh, from Tiffany, I assume it's Tiffany Caban and what she says, it, well, um, and she's also against the mandatory. Um, so um, someone else write, wrote um, about someone getting six years, six years on a $20 drug sale. Well, we know what that's about. Um, okay. Um, our next um, person is due at 745. So we still have a few minutes. Does anyone else, uh, any of the candidates have something they want to bring up? So I, think I just need to correct. I think us? if that's okay, Alan, I think I just need to um, like correct uh, an inaccuracy. I mean, I've had clients who have been violent predicate felons who faced a mandatory minimum of six years on a drug sale um, for nothing more than, than handing over, you know, one pill of Xanax. I, I mean, I'm, so I just want to point out that, that mandatory minimums are absolutely abhorrent and exist across the board. So I just, I just feel like I had to cut in and say that. Okay. Um, and I, I would just add, Alan, that we really have to trust judges on this issue, that judicial discretion exists for a reason. And some of Liz's concerns uh, can be addressed through the use of judicial discretion, but there's no reason be relying on outdated, antiquated, and excessive mandatory minimums. Okay, one of our um, writers in, Jacqueline Dumbruff, 
says that um, not all those who are charged with A1 drug felonies are big fish. So I don't know what that means, other than some of them probably don't deserve a mandatory. Um, um, if I may, Alan, also, um, I definitely ag agree with being able to assess individual circumstances, um, both personal and those giving rise to the behavior um, that's alleged in the, in the complaint. Um, I, I have to disagree a little bit with Ms. Lang here on judicial discretion. I think that's important, but everything needs guardrails. Um, and one of the things that allowed um, essentially uh, bail reform to rise to a level where it was essentially penalizing people who are not in a financial position to buy their freedom. Um, there was no mile markers. There was no way to assess or protect from that. And so even now with the calls for, for um, unfortunately gutting the bail reform by allowing judicial discretion to the extent that it um, allows an assessment of what dangerousness is, that it doesn't protect communities from the disproportionate incarceration and asking for cash bail. Um, so not only would I also not ask for cash bail, but I do think that judicial discretion uh, needs a check and balance system to it. Okay, um, another question here. Do you want to eliminate indeterminate sentences? I, anybody want to answer that? Okay. Um, well, I mean, what? I'm happy to die. I mean, this goes back to, to, you know, parole and not having faith in the parole board. So, um, you know, we could talk in theory about whether or not that it should be determined or indeterminate, but I would say under our current parole system, you know, it, they are empowered by, uh, you know, sentencing ranges when they get to make the decision. So I think it's a significant issue. And so I, I'm all for reforming the, the, the parole system. And one way to do that would be, a shift to uh, uh, determine it. I don't know if that's the ideal system, but it does underscore the problems that you've been talking about and others uh, with the with the parole. But also, I would say to that that parole has caused uh, um, a very dangerous loophole in our system. I've signed on to the Less Is More Act because majority of people who are tagged in the system through parole are prosecuted for parole violations, technical parole violations. And with that, it creates a loophole where there is no necessarily bail eligibility because it's not a new crime, but it's a technical violation based on, you know, not updating your address, not checking in with your caseworker, um, not being able to be gainfully employed. And so it's a form of uh, honestly negative social control um, that constantly keep people uh, in a position um, where they can be legally discriminated against in terms of employment and housing and financial opportunities uh, and access to opportunities that allow them to progress uh, and be successful adults in our society. So indeterminate sentences, uh, sentences are, I don't think we should look for parole to fill that gap. It's something that we should just basically find a way to take off the table. No, that, 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 so, so Ms. Abushi. But indeterminate sentences, inde inde indeterminate sentences can also help with um, shock, which is a program that is offered in prisons. If you have an indeterminate sentence, you can be shock eligible. Also in indeterminate sentences, you can be probation, you can have a split sentence where you can do half of your time, you can do six months in jail and half of, and, and the rest on probation. So I think there's a lot of different avenues and ways to go with, is, with indeterminate sentences that should be explored and just unilaterally getting rid of them they can help defendants stay out of jail longer as well. So I think that you have to look at the whole thing, as I've always said. But, but why not provide those opportunities that you hope to accomplish through parole and probation and other punitive measures that essentially are landmines where people who are trying to do right end up getting dragged back in for some reason instead of saying, we'll limit the prison term and then instead invest and fund and partner with community-based organizations that can provide these foundational resources to get people on their feet in a permanent way, as opposed to, again, like having the penalty hang over their head. I think- Well, I, well, I think the fact of the matter is, is that like, no matter what happens, there's also post-release supervision, which is different than parole or probation, where there's mandatory sentencing. So I just think like, arbitrarily being for things and against things aren't really the way to answer the question. I think, again, you have to look at every 
case and every case differently and every defendant and every set of facts differently. Respectfully, Ms. Crotty, it's not arbitrary. My father has post-release supervision. He has uh, probation and parole. Um, we've gone through this as a family. My clients have gone through this. I've seen this firsthand. This is not something that I get to look at from an ivory tower or even from a practitioner's position. I've seen what this does to families on the ground and families that have been trying to crawl out of the trenches that the prosecution system puts them in. And if we have to reorient ourselves as, as um, an office that builds people up and that gives them second chances, and not only that, but give them their boots to pull themselves up by instead of holding it back and saying, go be something now and be better. Um, and so that's the position that I come from and not only answering these questions, but in running for office, and my entire life's work. So I would, I would echo Ms. Abushi on that. that Alvin, I'm sorry. But now, I, I mean, I, I approach this from a very personal perspective too. You know, relative who was incarcerated, uh, and and I, I think we can have theoretical discussions, and that's why I said, Ms. Crotty, you know, in a perfect world uh, uh, was my response. But I think things that limit the control of uh, the parole board are are very important. Um, I've heard Ms. Abushi tell her story before. It's very powerful. I have a very similar one with my brother-in-law who was incarcerated. And I think we can have both. We can have post-incarceration supports that focus on housing um, and employment, which is what I was able to do for my brother-in-law, which the system did not do. But that's not to the exclusion of having a shorter jail sentence or having opportunities to cut a, a very bad uh, parole system out of uh, decision-making. You can have both. I think jump, and I'd like to jump in, please. Um, you know, when we talk about determinate and indeterminate sentences, what we're talking about is whether it's a solid one year or one to three, for example. But I would suggest that we need to be revisiting the very concept of what that means, because it is never just one year or one to three, because what we've seen is, depending on what someone pleads to, they can be barred from voting, they can be barred from, from employment with uh, certain government agencies running a minority business uh, enterprise. So I think the way we need to be thinking about this, when we think about determinate sentences, we need to actually be upfront about what it means when someone pleads guilty. They're not just doing the prison, which is horrible, but it's also the lifelong consequences. In, in my proposal, which will be coming out um, in, the, in the coming weeks, we'll talk about thinking, providing a true path to re-entry, which starts before someone even gets involved. We need to think it needs to be truth in sentencing. You can't have a life sentence for a mistake you had once. We need to be thinking about the collateral consequences. Okay. Um, while we're waiting, we have probably have another two or three minutes. Um, one of the um, laws um, for people who commit crimes is that they have to live within uh, at least, I think it's like 200 or maybe 500 feet away from a school or, or a church or um, you know any ha house of worship, daycare center, et cetera. And no matter what the crime is, even if it's a sex crime, once you're out and you serve your time, um, you can't go back to your family. There's very few places in New York that you could live um, that's uh, not 500 feet away from any of those facilities. So very often you can't go live with your spouse or your mother or your families, et cetera. And NYCHA won't even take anybody that served time. Um, how do you think this should be rectified? Should it be rectified? How do you keep people from going back into prison when they can't have a place to live? when they can't go back to their families. Alan, I'm so pleased that you raised this because in my work teaching in prisons, especially in Queensboro, which is a reentry facility in Long Island City, that many New Yorkers go through on their way back to the city after serving long prison sentences upstate. I have seen up front how uh, firsthand, how incredibly challenging it is for folks to come home, especially in the many, many circumstances under which they don't have a place to go because of NYCHA or other restrictions. And folks who end up in the shelter system, of course, uh, are, are subject to all of the vagaries of that system. And I think that this goes exactly to why what we need in New York City is collaborative, thoughtful, interagency leadership. This is not a criminal justice problem. This is a problem that can be solved only when we get the Department of Homeless Services, uh, Health and Hospitals, and, and all of the folks who are charged with supporting New Yorkers to the table to figure out how to support people when they come home. And that means removing some of those arbitrary restrictions. Okay, who else wants to answer that? 
I'll also jump in on this, uh, Alan, and say, you know, a, a lot of what I'm hearing as solutions, it's first create the damage and then find a way to fix it. That drains us of hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, when you, as a prosecutor in the Early Case Assessment Bureau, you'll have the opportunity to decide what to charge, who to charge, and then sentence recommendations. So, you know, to, to wait until you're meeting with incarcerated people or to wait until we're trying to figure out how to get incarcerated people back on their feet or back integrated in the community is to basically, you, we should ask the question, well, why did we do it in the first place? What was the wisdom behind these specific charges and the specific sentence that was requested? And then now are, you know, where is the funding coming from? Do we then pass this off as a problem to communities, community-based organizations and to families to figure out the way forward while our legislatures fight and really delay things. I mean, we can even see the laws that passed on the heels of the George Floyd protests. We're stuck in our legislatures for, for over five years. Um, and, and it was only recently pushed in because of, of all of that um, energy and pressure. And so when you think about how reintegration would work, we can't make it nearly impossible for the reintegration to happen first and then try to do damage control, uh, you know, talking out of the same side of our face. Okay, let me ask another question while we're waiting. Um, people in prison, people already ser currently serving time, should they be allowed to vote? And from what address? They should absolutely be allowed to vote. Um, I support full reenfranchisement of all people. It is a right. Um, and I think that while incarcerated, post-incarceration at all times, people should never lose their right to vote. Um, as to what address, I, I mean, I think that what we've seen in, in these gerrymandering ways that people will, will count the folks who are incarcerated in their prisons, um, in, in their communities, in these rural, often very white communities. And, and I think that that's not right either, that people should get the opportunity to have a say in who their legislature legislators are and who their district attorney is, et cetera, um, in their own home. Um, I too am for full right to vote. I think that the gerrymandering that, that Ms. Island, Orleans talked about has hurt um, my neighborhood here in Harlem. And I would note that I believe the two states that allow for voting while you're in custody are Vermont and Maine. There's certainly two states uh, that are overwhelmingly white. It just shows you the, the underlying racial issue here. So I'm for full, uh, full voting. I am as well. Absolutely. Um, um, sorry, Honey, you want to go? Oh, Diana, no, go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm for it as well. And, and I think if we really are serious about say, investing in people and seeing people as people, if in fact they need to go to prison, they need to be able to vote in their communities. They're coming back to their our community, the community that they offended in, and they should vote in that community as well. It should be an absentee ballot. That's where they should be voting. Okay. Uh, I, I definitely agree with uh, enfranchising voters, but um, I would also note that for the census, uh, incarcerated people are counted for purposes of the census, and money is often taken out of the communities where these mass incarcerations are occurring. Are occurring. So um, you have places like, um, you know, out of state uh, prisons in the Midwest, um, even even. You know, New York State has a good amount of people, but most we send most of the people out of state for certain offenses. And so we have to find a way to not only keep the money here, but also make sure that we're enfranchising people. And again, if the goal or, or the intention of past prosecutors in, in advocating for jail sentences is that there will be rehabilitation, then the aftermath of that, which includes the difficulty of voting or not having the right to vote, and then trying to figure out a way to patch that up and rectify that damage, it goes back to this archaic mindset of, of having the false premise of, you know, we must incarcerate to achieve public safety and we must incarcerate and keep a hook in people and constantly drag them back in the system is something that really needs to be evaluated. And, and if we care about these social inequities and disenfranchising, uh, families and their community, then it, it goes back to the decisions that we are making as district attorneys at the outset. Um, I'm happy to share in the chat my op-ed from the Washington Post earlier this summer on precisely this subject. I don't think it's a question of re-enfranchising people. It is a question of ending the removal of the franchise because people are convicted. And that is a direct legacy of uh, post-Civil War era racist policies, and it's time to end that. 
Any other comment on this? Who, somebody who didn't comment? Okay. Um, what, okay, are there any other, anybody want to make a closing statement? Because any minute, we're already late with um, Janos, who I don't think is on yet. Brad, would you like to say something, being that it's your legislation that you're trying to cure all these problems? You have to un unmute. I just, uh, let me just say, I appreciate the, the widespread support that I hear for elder parole. It's uh, legislation that's long overdue. It, it's shown that, um, you know, we've got 10,000 elder uh, incarcerated individuals in, in our state prison system. Uh, not only is it cruel and inhumane to not allow these individuals who've served, you know, 15 years or longer or 55 years or older to reconnect with their families and their communities, but it's costing the state billions of dollars, literally a year, uh, because these are, the, these are the most frail and vulnerable and they require uh, a lot of medical attention uh, to say the least. So I just want to thank all the candidates for their fulsome uh, support on this, on this bill and for, for, for you, Alan, for, uh, for pushing the issue uh, on clemency, on parole uh, and on elder parole. What we need is a new way of looking at the parole board. We need a new parole board um, that's, more, that's professionalized, um, that spends more than 15 minutes looking at a case that actually takes into account people's um, um, you know, uh, ability to, to grow and to, 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 um, to make uh, a change in their lives. So thank you. Well, if I may, we need people on the pro board who have served time, who are advocates yep. for um, those in prison and um, legal aid attorneys instead of career prosecutors. And some of the people who have been appointed have nothing to do with the criminal justice system and they're just political perks, such as Jay Kriegel from Buffalo. Absurd that he's on the parole board. And he was appointed by David Patterson. Um, okay, um, any other questions? You know, I think this has been really great and I'm glad it turned into a debate um, or a discussion like this. Um, we do have two more candidates, three more candidates, um, and one of them is late. So if anybody, again, has anything that they want to say, please feel free, even if you're not a candidate. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that um, at, the, at the beginning of COVID, not only did I, I call for the release of uh, aging people, but those who are also health compromised, and I uh, am the only candidate to pull out a policy that put us in a proactive position to act to take the initiative and review sentences of people age 55 or older or that have uh, health compromised uh, circumstances for release. Let me ask you, Tahani, um, can you put together a letter and either you or I, the club, can ask all the candidates to sign to the governor demanding that he start releasing the elderly um, with, his, you know, with the risk assessment, of course, um, like the governor of California has done to thousands of people. These people are literally dying. Prisons are a petri dish for um, disease. We all know that. But nobody pays attention. They're not nursing homes. I'm, I'm happy to take that initiative. And we've supported Vocal's efforts um, to bring that to his attention. But apparently, he's writing books and drawing okay, maps. We'll, we'll do the letter, and we'll ask everybody to sign it, OK? Yes. Um, and we'll be willing to take suggestions as far as amendments to the letter. And we'll get um, our attorney here, David Ziffer, to help with us. Um, David is president of Village Independent Democrats and is also on our board of governors. Um, and if people want to get active in the club, we have many um, 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 forums like this and demonstrations and et cetera. Um, you know, let me know, email me at aroskoff at mac.com and um, join us. We have a hundred person board of governors and then we have 15 officers and um, it's a wide spectrum of people and um, from all over. And um, 
We are considered an LGBT club. Majority of our board and member, uh, our board of governors are LGBTQ. Um, and we do have many straight people on and probably one or two are in the closet. Um, so, um, any, anybody want to say anything else before I pick on somebody? Um, anybody, anybody? Yes, um, Scott Kaplan. My question, uh, do any of the candidates envision a role for the district attorney to prosecute elected officials, which has been largely reserved for federal prosecutors uh, based upon perceived problems under state uh, laws? Uh, Alan, this is Alvin Bragg. I'm happy to go first on this if you'd like. Uh, so so I, I um, have spent mo most of my career doing public corruption prosecutions. I brought the case that led to the conviction of right. Malcolm Smith, uh, who was the former majority Senate leader. Uh, that was a federal case. That was when I was a federal prosecutor. But there really is, I mean, looking at the state and federal law, the types of cases that we've did federally, I believe that uh, structuring the investigation uh, uh, appropriately and properly, those kind of cases can be done. And there are many reasons that they should be the focus of the Manhattan DA's office. The DA's office obviously has City Hall, um, has a number of electeds, has a lot of uh, government procurement monies flowing through. And so in addition to electeds, I would also say I've, I've done cases where, you know, we prosecuted someone who was uh, pretending to be a disabled veteran who got $16 million of contracts set aside for a company owned by a disabled veteran. So I would prioritize that work. Uh, and I've, I've done a body of it. And I know how to translate it from the federal work to the state work. And I think it will translate well into my leadership. Yeah, and I'd like to jump in as well. I've done that work as well. And you know, um, under the Supreme Court rulings over the last few years, frankly, unfortunately, as we saw with the retrials of Shelley Silver and others, the federal law has been um, really sort of gutted. So it's really important for state um, prosecutors like the Manhattan DA's office to jump in and um, prosecute public integrity. And, and I would prioritize that. And there's ways you can do it proactively as well. We don't have to be reactive and wait you know, for something to come to us. We can scrutinize um, donations. We can scrutinize um, uh, bank records and we can take a look actively and, and, and bring that look because when we don't do that kind of work, we all lose faith in our government and, and, and we are, we're at a, a historic low right now. So it's really important. I've done the work and I would make sure that it was a priority uh, when I'm DA. Okay, our next candidates here, unless somebody had a burning desire to finish to answer this question. Okay, um, um, Janice Martin's here. We, we, we became a debate or um, a forum because we were waiting for candidates to come. So you missed that, but you now have your opportunity to be fierce. Three minutes on presentation, and then we're gonna go to questions and answers. Welcome. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Alan, and, and thank you to everyone in the Jim Ellis Democratic Club. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be here. I have so much respect for this club's commitment to electing progressive Democrats, and I have a great uh, respect to Jim Owls, to Alan, to the whole generation of LGBTQ activists who made this a better city to grow up, a less hostile city to grow up for people like me and my generation. Uh, I'm running for Manhattan District Attorney because I fundamentally don't believe that jails and prisons are the solution to society's problems. For me, these issues are personal. I grew up in Mayor Giuliani's New York. I know what it's like to be stopped and frisked, to be arrested, uh, to be in the tombs for the night, scared with 30 other men, not sure what's going to happen next. Uh, but while things turned out all right for me, uh, you know, my life has turned out all right for thousands of New Yorkers who cycle through our jail system every year. Just being in jail can mean the loss of jobs, housing, the ability to raise your family. Uh, the experiences I had shaped me. I became an activist and an organizer. I came home to go to Fordham Law School to focus on criminal justice and civil rights. I practiced civil rights with Norman Siegel, investigated corruption at the Moreland Commission, uh, looking into real estate and Andrew Cuomo's corruption. I managed a campaign to close Rikers Island, getting a whole city to look at the people who have lived through our criminal justice system differently and move towards uh, closing this horrific stain on our city's moral values. 
and I worked at the ACLU managing a national campaign for decarceration. Now I'm bringing those ideas to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. We have nine great candidates in this race. I'm the only candidate who's called for an 80% reduction in our jail population. I'm the only candidate who's called for ending the war on drugs by abolishing the Office of Special Narcotics Prosecutor that perpetuates so much harm. I'm for ending cash bail. Uh, I'm for decriminalization and for investing in communities and taking on the special interests, be they employers who steal from their workers, landlords who criminally harass tenants, or corrupt politicians who engage in possibly criminal shady deals with developers. This is a different perspective that I'm gonna to bring to the Manhattan DA's office. I've got a long track record of getting things done when people think it wasn't possible. Right after I ran the Close Rikers campaign, I went down to St. Louis to work with activists who'd been forged in the fires of Ferguson to close their horrific local jail to workhouse. Well, just two years later, I'm happy to say that the St. Louis Board of Aldermen has voted to close what may be the worst jail in America. They voted unanimously to do it by the end of this year. Uh, we have so much work to do here in New York to fix our broken criminal justice system. And I have the perspective, the lived experience, and the professional experience to get it done. Uh, we are facing immense challenges right now as a city. There's no question about that. Uh, between COVID, the economic depression, and just generally people's level of anxiety is higher than ever. And that's what I think you're seeing in some of the really difficult discourse around things like people, people experiencing homelessness, living in hotels and gun violence being up. And we need to be creative and thoughtful and bold in how we tackle some of these really hard problems in the challenging couple of years that this city has ahead. But let me assure you that my values are unshakable. No matter what solutions we come up with, I'm firm in my belief that putting people in prison is not going to solve the problems that our city faces. So if you're looking for reform, you're gonna have a lot of great candidates to choose from, but if you're looking for someone transformational who's gonna change our system, I hope I can be your next Manhattan DA. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And we're gonna to go to questions um, on D, uh, decrim. I believe you already addressed that, totally for um, decriminalization of sex work. Alan, you're talking to me specifically, just so I'm, so I'm clear on the format. <laughs> oh, decriminalization of sex. Yes, yes of course. Yes, very, very much for and it. Were you, um, were you um, lobby against um, the Nordic model? Yes, no, and I take my, in all things, I take my leadership from people most directly impacted and the leadership of sex workers in this city has been very clear that the Nordic model is not an answer, uh, that uh, they support and they know best and I'm willing to stand with them and lobby against that approach. Okay, the um, walking while trans bill, you're for it, I assume? Yes. Okay, um, elder parole bill. Absolutely, and as well as the other uh, parole legislation, I believe that RAP is doing uh, some of the most important work in the state right now around criminal justice and so I support both of their legislative priorities in Albany as well as their effort to got elderly people out of our prison system, which is still a problem five months into COVID. There's been very little movement on that. And I strongly support releasing more elderly people from prison now because of COVID especially. We're gonna be putting together a letter, um, which we're gonna ask all the DA candidates to sign um, to the governor. Sign me up. And releasing people. Um, uh, did you support the record relief legislation, which would make relief available to survivors of, of human trafficking? Um, I'm not familiar with that piece of legislation now, but I'd be happy to. In other to words, the victims of human trafficking who have been sentenced, et cetera, um, relief. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Will you, for, will you affirmatively seek to hire incarcerated individuals? Absolutely. And that one, I have a long track record of doing that. At Just Leadership, I uh, supervised many formerly incarcerated people and worked alongside and worked for uh, a formerly incarcerated person. Uh, I believe strongly in redemption and that people have a lot to offer their communities when they have when come home. When I was at the ACLU, I hired more than a dozen formerly incarcerated people for roles across the United States, including two people into senior leadership roles. Will you visit correctional facilities um, on people who have um, put in for parole or people who you believe should, um, should receive parole or clemency? Um, go up to Bedford, go up to um, Otisville, et cetera, like Gail Brewer did. Yeah, um, I hadn't thought of it in that specific context, Alan. I'm very much in favor of uh, 
all people who have the responsibility for sending people to jails and prisons, understanding the consequences of what they're doing. I think that's part of what's missing in the uh, discussions around criminal justice is just the severity of what it actually means to be in a jail or prison cell. So I'm absolutely for visiting prison facilities because that's ultimately where when people do commit a high enough level of harm that our office will seek prison sentences, we need to know what that actually means. Why are we sending, are we sending people to places that uh, are out of step with our, our values as New Yorkers. And to that effect, I would want my assistant district attorneys to visit Rikers Island and to visit the tombs. And uh, I mean, I think those are the only two pretrial places anybody uh, would be. But I think our ADAs need to uh, be personally, intimately, tactilely familiar with what a jail is if they are going to stand up in court and say that somebody should be there. The reason we ask for the other facilities also is because previous DAs have given many uh, too long a sentence to um, people who committed crimes decades ago and they really deserve to be revisited to what kind of people they are now. Sure. Um, sanctuary cities, do you support it? And what would you do to um, protect New York as a sanctuary city and the um, undocumented um, immigrants? Sure. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a son of two immigrants, uh, you know, one of whom never became a citizen before he passed. And so, uh, I believe that New York is a city of immigrants. That's one of the things that makes us beautiful and strong. Uh, from, our, from my view, the best way to protect immigrants in this city is twofold. One is to have a system where everybody in the office is trained on the collateral consequences of immigration uh, policy. You know, everybody understands the consequences of pursuing different uh, aspects of a case uh, and what will harm immigrants, uh, particularly, well, both legal, honestly, and undocumented immigrants. Uh, which, which will affect them adversely and knowing that going into the process and doing their best to not put people in a position where they'll face deportation. As it relates to certain types of offenses, we can look at how we can uh, structure uh, a pleas uh, or structure uh, alternatives to incarceration before anybody has to admit guilt so that we can uh, seal their case and not have to worry about a person being pursued for immigration conviction. Okay, uh, mandatory sentencing. Do you believe that the um, that there should be mandatory min minimum sentences? No, and I have. Uh, I was the first candidate to put out a proposal saying that we will not seek sentences longer twenty years, with the exception of, you know, there may be extremely heinous situations or uh, abnormal situations that call for it. But by and large, uh, I agree with the the leadership of people around the country who have been pushing. For the U.S. to stop being the country that uh, forces the longest sentences on people in the world. And so our office will not seek sentences longer than 20 years, except in exceptional cases. And what I think that'll do for other cases and other sentencing is, is right size the whole system. Frankly, you know, there is a deterrent aspect to law enforcement, of course, and there is, you know, a, a punishment that's necessary in some cases to, for a person to be held accountable for the harm they commit. But the reality is that the difference between a sentence being 15 years and a sentence being five is not gonna change what's happening in the street. And so I think by capping sentences at 20 years, we'll be able to right size the whole rest of our sentencing structure so that we're not looking to punish people for years and years, then have them come home with even greater difficulty reintegrating. Why won't you consider changing it to be in, um, in accordance with the bills that our friends have introduced in Albany so that it's 15 years? Which, who introduced that bill? Before the 15 year, before mandatory parole, but you're talking about 20 year sentences, why not make it 15? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, the 20 year number comes from the uh, sentencing project, which is a, a national uh, effort to uh, correct prison sentencing policies around the country. Uh, you know, as with all things, I think I would be uh, interested in hearing um, from advocates what their thinking and, and, and as well as other experts in the field. There's no reason I would be categorically against number 15 versus 20, but the number 20 does come from a, a demand being made by families who have been impacted by this system from across the country. Okay, um, are people sending me questions? Here's some, one more minute. Would you lobby Albany to end felony disenfranch and disenfranchisement and have New York join Maine and Vermont in allowing incarcerated people to vote from prison? 
That was a great question. I've, I've already, already, already there. Uh, you know, I, um, when I was at the ACLU, the ACLU supported the nationwide prison strike in 2018. This is the largest ever strike conducted by people in prison in American history. It was done across many states. And, you know, they had 10 demands in that, in that strike. And when I was speaking with one of the, the leaders about, well, you know, I'm going to get the chance to speak about this. Of these 10, what's the most important to you? And he said, the right for people in prison to vote, because the right to vote is the right from which all other rights emanate. And so uh, in 2018, I specifically worked uh, on this issue, you know, promoting, promoting universal suffrage, as I call it. And um, I think that it's a great idea. I would so for me, I would continue to advocate for that position. Question from Tiffany Kabam, who, by the way, does club work very hard for, including doing massive um, literature mailing. Um, she'd like to know what the candidate's plans to hold off um, police officers accountable, strategies extending beyond prosecuting officers. And yeah. do you think the police, uh, from us, do you think the police budget is bloated? And where do you stand on defund? Yeah, I, I was very public and early in my demand uh, supporting uh, Communities United for Police Reform and other advocates uh, calling for a at least $1 billion cut from the budget. I actually put out a statement that was signed by 50 candidates for city council in 2021, as well as the mayoral candidate, Diane Morales, uh, saying that we would like a billion dollars in cuts and articulating how it could happen uh, without affecting public safety. I think in the long run, uh, you know, I've tangled with the NYPD uh, throughout my life, uh, not only as a, as a teenager, but professionally as a litigator, uh, suing the NY NYPD twice early in my career, working as policy counsel at the CCRB, specifically investigating police misconduct. Uh, and so I know how hard it is to go head to head with NYPD and how much power they hold. And so I think in the long run, the most effective way to reduce uh, police corruption, police violence, and and police, the police department and their unions hold over the city politic is to reduce the size of the police department. Okay, uh, so, question. Yeah. Um, just as the, the office has a um, unit to investigate innocence, going back over cases, legal aid has put in hundreds of um, applications for clemency. Would you have people in your office review the ones that are relevant to Manhattan to see if you want to jump in and help some of the people that have been over-sentenced by a, pre a previous Manhattan DA? Absolutely. Um, like, I, you know, I think that is the way to implement our 20-year policy retrospectively. Uh, I think that if somebody has already served a significant amount of time, 10, 15 years in the prison system, um, our office would be open to reviewing such applications and uh, either taking a position of neutrality if we, if we don't have strong feelings about it, or taking a position that, wow, this person has worked really hard to turn their life around and is ready to come back to the community sooner okay. than the acceptance suggests. Thank you very, very much. We have our next candidate. Is there a burning desire from a previous candidate to answer the last question about having a unit to invest to see if people have been over sentenced? Okay, seeing none, let's go on. Assembly member and DA candidate Dan Court, I'm not, you're unmuted. You have three minutes to present your case, and then we go to questions and answers. Thank you. Welcome, Dan. Welcome. Thank you, Alan, and thank you to the group and uh, my colleagues, competitors in this race uh, for district attorney. Uh, my favorite book about the criminal legal system has very little to do with being a lawyer. Uh, Jill Lovey, an LA Times reporter, wrote a book, Ghetto Side, about her experiences covering uh, the LAPD and homicide rates in Los Angeles in the mid-2000s, ironically, when Bill Bratton was police commissioner there at that time. Um, and the book is fascinating about a look at policing and prosecution, but one statistic or statement in that book really holds true to me about what's significant, um, and that's that uh, the, the mortality rate for Marines in Fallujah in the mid-2000s was lower than the mortality rate for black men and boys in South Central Los Angeles because of the low clearance rate and the low prosecution of murder in Los Angeles. And Jill Lovey wrote about that time period, wrote something significant. She wrote that the law is a coward against that, excuse me, the law is a bully against that which is easy and a coward against that which is hard. 
That's been a system in place by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office for 11 years under Cy Vance. Um, he didn't create that system of punitive prosecution, but he exacerbated it and he made it worse. He failed to use the incredible powers of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to reverse those trends, to fight back against a punitive criminal legal system. And I'm running in for district attorney not to be a kinder, gentler prosecutor, not to do the smaller things, but to deconstruct, to rebuild this office that is consistently failing Manhattanites. And I'm gonna do that in three very specific ways. First and foremost, revamping the sex crimes unit within the office. I'm proud of the fact I'm the only candidate has put forth a nine point proposal on how to revamp a completely failed and dysfunctional department within the office. Secondly, end the spying techniques that Vance employs on communities of color. Start with eliminating the so-called gang database list, which targets communities of color, like the one I grew up in Washington Heights. And secondly, speak up for the infringement of Fourth Amendment rights that Vance tramples on so often, and I have legislation in Albany to stop. And lastly, the thing I'm most synonymous with in Albany is ending all sorts of uh, policies that punish poor people with no public safety benefit. From my refusal to back down on ending cash bail to my seven year fight with Vance on ending his criminalization of work tool, I will employ and put in forth many of these policies to end the punishment of both race and poverty within the district attorney's office. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Billy, can you email me? A oh, you're, that's something else. <laughs> okay. Um, because I know you personally, but other people should know your answers. The elder parole bill. Uh, I'm a co-sponsor. I fought for it. I've fought against the watered down. Uh, I, I was willing to vote no in committee in Albany on bills that would water down. This is such a significant thing. Um, that, and all this bill does is mandate someone over the age of 55 be eligible for parole. It is not an automatic mechanism for release. And so many people have written, it's almost a fact now of aging out of people's violent phase. Essentially, by the time somebody is 35 or 40, they are not the person they were in their 20s who committed that crime. The okay, elder man, parole- we, yeah. need to, we just need answers because we've been, we've handled this issue. We needed to know where you were. Um, um, Decrim. I support the Gottfried Salazar bill. I'm a co-sponsor. Okay, and would you work against the Nordic model if it came up? You know I would, Alan. Okay, sanctuary cities, what would you do to protect immigrants and further New York as a sanctuary city? I think DA Gonzalez has the right idea with uh, Im imputing multiple immigration attorneys within different departments of the district attorney's office. I would follow the lead of Eric in that respect and build upon that. By, by protecting our immigrant communities. Okay, um, on the issue of parole, um, um, regarding um, remorse and, um, and uh, rehabilitation, um, do you consider that uh, more important than um, the nature of the original crime? Yes, I, we, but we need to go beyond that, Alan. Um, we need to defund portions of the corrections budget through the state budget. Um, we talk a lot about defunding police, and I know there's a question at that, but parole is a giant, uh, many aspects of parole is a giant waste of time, and we need to eliminate many aspects of it. Okay, will you commit to visiting um, um, correctional facilities um, when he, if elected like district attorney yep. and talking to people about their parole, their clemency applications that come before you um, because they're people that were, um, incarcerated because of the efforts of previous DAs. I already have as a legislator and will continue as district attorney. Solitary confinement. Uh, I've been a vocal advocate, co-sponsor of legislation to end it. Refuse to go along with efforts in the legislature to allow the governor to move by a ministerial action to deal with this because he simply won't. Uh, so uh, I've been a forceful, of, forceful advocate of legislation to end solitary confinement not deferring to docs to do so. Okay, we are gonna be putting together a letter. We're gonna be asking all the um, candidates to sign regarding um, demanding that the governor stop releasing the elderly who are prone to um, get the virus. Um, and um, we're gonna ask you to sign it. Would you be apt to signing it? I would be apt. Apt, because you have to see the final version. I understand that. That's right. Um, voting. Uh, do you think people who are presently incarcerated should be voting? Yes. 
Okay, would you commit to not taking any real estate money um, in, in your bid for district attorney, any at all? And would you refuse money from, from um, people like Steve Ross, besides just being real estate, he's a he's, um, Donald Trump flunky? No, I, I'm, I'm not going to limit myself. Uh, in, Steve Ross is a different respect, but I'm not going to limit myself in real estate money. Uh, I don't believe it's a conflict to being district attorney, Alan. Okay, but don't you, doesn't the district attorney investigate the uh, real estate industry? Aren't they currently doing that? Or, or they did that recently? Isn't it a, a, a something that's constantly investigated in New York City? The district attorney investigates criminal conduct, whether that's in the real estate industry. And if individuals in the real estate industry file false instruments, that's an e-felony and I would prosecute. Um, but it, we go after wrongdoing and criminal conduct. We don't go after people's specific professions. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, what relationship you have with the LGBT community? And also, what kind of demonstrations and press conferences, uh, demonstrations and protests and rallies have you been on for what issues? And what have you done in the Resist Trump movement? Well, I, I, I've, I've been at multiple pride marches, I think three or four over the last 10, 12 years. Um, in the Resist Trump effort, um, I, I would go to, to many different things, but specifically uh, to a Black Lives Matter protest on East 9th Street and Avenue D. And the reason why is that was PSA 4, where Officer Garcia in a, uh, on May 4th or May 10th put his, put his knee in an individual's neck for 15 seconds. So I thought it was important to be on East 9th Street protesting PSA 4 and Officer Garcia, who was on desk duty. Instead, he should be terminated. Uh, that's a longer discussion about 50A and the police misconduct uh, in police Shay's refusal uh, to actually uh, get rid of officers like Officer Garcia. But that's where I was, and that's the type uh, of activity. I wouldn't stop just because I was district attorney protesting what was unjust. Would you um, refuse to be a member of the New York State District Attorney Association? Yes. It's a fallacy to believe that anyone can join that association and reform it. I've been in conflict with them for nine years in Albany. They are, for the most part, irredeemable. I will not join. Okay, do you believe that Dermot Shea should be, um, should resign or be fired? And um, if you were elected, would you vocally challenge Shea when he abuses his power or misuses data to talk about causes of crime? I already have, Alan. Uh, two days, in November of last year, um, in Puerto Rico, when he was two days on the job, I spoke for him for 45 minutes and told him that the NYPD gang database technology and spyware was wrong. Three months later, I stood at City Hall and took Shea and de Blasio to task for their bait and switch on bail policies. Uh, so it's not what will I do, it's what I've already been doing and will continue to hold Shea uh, accountable. People should also talk about Shea being a member of a hate group. He's a registered Republican. Okay, okay next question. Ah, oh, Alvin liked that one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, do we have any um, other questions coming in? Um, I think we answered, if you want to do a wrap up so you can have your entire time, another two minutes or so. Uh, I'll, yes, I, I know I can imagine uh, I jumped on a little late. My apologies, I'm sure for all the people listening. It's been uh, a long night of questions with my colleagues running. I'll just say briefly, I'm running uh, for district attorney uh, against some very good lawyers who would all make a better district attorney than Cy Vance. The thing that I think distinguishes me from these good lawyers is my nine years of being in complete conflict with Vance. And I've been doing this since September of 2011 when I was elected. Um, this is not uh, being for reform, being in conflict with Vance, setting up uh, suggestions on policy of how I would run the office. This is not d something that I did recently. In 2011, when I picked up uh, in October of 2011, my seven year fight to stop Vance from criminalizing work tools that was misinterpreted as knives. I followed that up by building off a coalition of two courageous Black Lives Matters protesters who refused to take plea deals. And we built a coalition 
that three years ago forced Cy Vance to rescind a memorandum of understanding that gave the NYPD the ability to prosecute those that at rest at protest. I have been fighting Vance in the legislature and through the bully pulpit of my office since the day I was elected. And I've had to defend those views before actual voters every two years. Um, if you vote for me, that's the type of district attorney I'll be. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, we are waiting for one more candidate who's due in another 10 minutes or so. So if anybody, any of the candidates want to comment on whatever was, um, whatever you wish, any of the questions that we asked there in court, any clarification on previous um, comments. Okay. Does anybody want to, who's not a candidate, would you like to say something? I'll unmute you. Trip, you're I wanted like to you just want to uh, opine something. on the consensus that seems to be that the prosecution problem started with Vance. <clears throat> Vance might be the current DA, um, but the system of mass incarceration and the mass criminalization of people of color and low income communities has been going on for decades long before he ever stepped foot in that office. And I reiterate that Manan has had four DAs in the last century. Never had a female hold that position, never had a person of color. So to begin the new day, um, only 10 years ago, I mean, I, you know, I'm not um, that old, but I'm old enough to have been practicing for a little over 10 years. And I recognize this system was a problem at 14 years old. And I saw its effect and impact in my communities in every hoop I had to jump through, even as a woman of color running for office, um, the resistance, the criticisms, the extra work that we have to put in, happy to put it in and work 10 times as hard. But this is not something superficial, not something that should be taken lightly. We need somebody in office that's going to be fearless in the face of power, fearless in the face of lobbying powers. And um, for me, I set myself apart from the other candidates because I don't come from an office where you essentially have a cheerleading squad, where you all move in unison and you all can advocate for the same values and you have a targeted adversary. Um, I am a, someone as a civil rights attorney, a trial attorney that has brought powers like the NYPD and the FDNY and our Department of Education to court, to trial by elevating the issues and concerns of our community and forcing that change and making it happen. And that's what we're gonna need here. And we can't really underestimate that reality because Alan, you raised it a few times, right? There's a lot of pressures that's not gonna let a lefty DA just come in and overhaul the system. So what's gonna ensure that we don't get there and sell out? And the only thing that would ensure that is having somebody that has a track record of standing up um, to the powers that be and if actually effectuating change. Alan, can I just address- Yes, absolutely, Alvin. Uh, so, so uh, you know, I was, I was in court last week. You, you, this goes to your question about standing up to the NYPD and Shea. Uh, we filed the suit before he was commissioner, so it's against O'Neill, but suing the, you know, O'Neill, uh, the mayor, uh, you know, for, for, uh, seeking details about Eric Garner's death on behalf of uh, police accountability organizers. Uh, so that was as recently as last week. I agree with Ms. Abushi. These issues you know, go back a long way. 20 years ago in my first case, I was suing the state police for excessive force. So my commitment to these uh, issues professionally is longstanding and obviously personally go back, as I said before, uh, you know, to my young teenager years. Okay. Alan, uh, yes. may I just jump in? Yeah, you know, uh, I just want to address the issue of the corrupting effect of money in our politics. Uh, I think that while it is true that, uh, you know, people of all different professional backgrounds can and do commit crimes, uh, we know that real estate has had a corrosive effect on our politics in this city, and it's created a kind of city that often disrupts communities in terrible ways. And I think that is why, not so much as just a DA candidate, but as a candidate for political office in New York, I'm rejecting real estate money. I'm also rejecting money from law enforcement unions and rejecting money from lawyers who practice regularly before the Manhattan DA's office, which is more unfortunate because some of those people agree with what I'm saying, but we can't take checks from them. And I think it's really important to have values that say, we're gonna draw our power from the community, like we did with the Close Rikers campaign, right? 
organize in communities, work with communities to get these kind of changes done and not rely on the big money players who have dominated our political landscape at the city, state, and even federal level. Okay, thank you. Um, I just, I just would like to chime in that, that I've been a defense attorney for 12 years and I've been representing clients for 12 years and fighting against the system for 12 years. It is my past 12 years of experience which has led me into joining this race with these talented group of lawyers. I think that you have to call to task what has been going on and how do we move forward. But the other thing is, is that you have to understand the system which you're going into and how it works. And I think that that's a fundamental need for someone who's going to go into this office. And if I could just address the issue of real estate, and I agree, it, uh, corporate corruption is not just in real estate or corporate or corruption. It's many important arguments about the way we can You're it. going in and out. Uh, can you hear me better? Is that better? Yeah, much better. Uh, I was just going to say that that it's I agree that you know real estate corruption is not it's not limited to real estate I mean there's corruption in construction and many corporate industries and it's important to be targeted about that but what I want to say is I'm not taking real estate money developer money and I'm not taking uh, law enforcement uh, money as well or bail bondsman money mainly because these are two particular industries that have really, or two areas that really have been um, held above the law. They've been above the law. They've acted with impunity for too long. So the, I think it's not that, that, they're, that we're going to take it from others because uh, the others don't commit crimes. It's that to, at this point, nobody trusts that, that real estate um, or police, frankly, adult, aren't going to have an undue influence. So that's why I'm not, I pledge not to take that type of uh, campaign contributions. Okay, the last two candidates, uh, um, I, we didn't ask you this question. Um, the district attorney in Philadelphia came in and he somewhat cleaned the house because there were many career prosecutors who didn't see their, saw their job differently than he did as a reformer. And um, many quit in protest of his policies and he hired a lot of people from the legal aid world and changed the office. How, what would you be doing along those lines? And if you kept uh, most of the people from Cy Vance's office, what guarantee do you have um, that they would follow different rules when they've been doing the same thing for the last 30 or 40 years? That to me, Alan? Either one. You could go, Dan, and then Janice. Go ahead, Dan. I'll go after. Sure. Um, there's, there's about 360 lawyers in the Philadelphia District Attorney Office. About 40 were, uh, gave their resignation before Krasner took office. And that was honorable because they simply didn't share his views on prosecution or anything else. And then about six months within the job, Larry uh, Krasner had to terminate about 38 or so. So within an office of 360 lawyers, um, Krasner terminated about 80 of those lawyers. Uh, I think similarly, uh, that's the sort of uh, house cleaning that I would have to do as district attorney because it's not enough to change the leadership team or change one or two bureau chiefs. Um, there needs to be wholesale change. Also, that's only step one. Step two is a different recruiting process. Um, Vance has generally a view uh, that uh, he will go across the country uh, to get the best and brightest and that he can achieve diversity and excellence um, you know, by going outside of New York City. Um, that's his right, but I would go for a different approach. I think you can achieve both diversity and excellence here in New York City from New York City law schools. Um, give me that young person who's uh, going to school at night. He or she may not have graded onto law review, but maybe they're in the top 20, 30 percent of their class and working a job during the day. I want that young person who maybe grew up in New York, New York City to be the assistant district attorney. And then for continuity within the office, we're going to tap, tap into some of the forfeiture fund money, loan forgiveness for years four, five, six, and seven. Because too often you train these lawyers for three years and then you lose them when they leave. I wanna try and keep more of this office. So different recruitment, diversity, getting more New York City law students, and then keeping them longer through loan forgiveness, okay. especially because loan okay. forgiveness okay. under Trump has been a colossal failure. 95% of federal loan forgiveness requests have been rejected under the Trump administration. 
So we're going to have to do it within our own auspices of the district attorney's office. Thank you, Dan. Alan, may I respond to Ms. Brody's comment? Uh, Alvin, I'm, I'm responding to Alan's question. Oh, first. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No All good. Um, so I believe that we need a wholesale shakeup of the leadership of the Manhattan DA's office. I would replace all of the bureau chiefs uh, and bring in my own team. I think, look, one of the reasons I believe that we can do such transformative changes in New York is because we are a city that has such great resources, such great nonprofits, such great infrastructure to help people. And similarly, we have an incredible legal bar here in New York. I do think that I've, I've known DAs across the country who have struggled with this issue, like Wesley Bell in St. Louis. But the reality is in New York, the legal bar has the talent and the experience to bring in so many, not just folks from legal aid and civil rights lawyers, but people who worked many years in the DA's office and left out of frustration and disgust and have the skills to come back and build a new kind of office. So I'm very confident that we can have major wholesale changes to the leadership and keep carrying on fine and actually execute this vision. For those who want to, who are in the office now, especially younger folks, I would say they would have to adapt to a different standard of what excellence means, not just conviction rates, but having to buy into a different standard of what public safety and justice looks like. If they can do that, then they're welcome to stay. I'm sure many of them are very bright and talented. And so, um, but we also need to diversify the office. You know, I've in my last three roles, been very focused on hiring people of color and women and uh, try to make sure that the Manhattan DA's office has much more diversity in all of those areas, especially people who come from New York City and its different communities. Okay, um, before we, um, what, I, I said Steve Ross before I was corrected as Steve Roth uh, when I talked about uh, real estate. And I should know that because I unfortunately live in a related building. Unfortunately, it's his. Okay, we have a question coming in here with a comment. Um, will you oppose efforts to add dangerousness to the bail laws? That's from Billy Friedland. And then we have from Jim Yates, critical question put by Billy Friedland. Dangerousness is code language for locking up young black males. So important a question. Who would like to address that? I can jump in um, the, I would definitely oppose and push back on that term because the very factors that are going to go into evaluating what dangerous means is going to be um, factors of social inequities. So whether they are gainfully employed, their education level, the, the zip code of where they live in, the type of housing that they live in, um, all of these things are going to be factors to culminate into dangerousness. And what that's going to do is just perpetuate the mass criminalization of social inequities like poverty, homelessness, substance use disorder. Um, and, and so that shouldn't be a consideration and, and I would push back against it. Alan, if I could, uh, uh, I've been at the center of the fight in Albany, in the assembly, leading the efforts uh, to fight back against the rollbacks to the reform. But even before we passed the reform um, that was unfortunately rolled back in April, which I voted against, I've been at the center of the fight against allowing a dangerous standard in our bail laws. Um, essentially, dangerousness as used, whether it's a public safety exception or the word dangerousness, is tantamount uh, to race and most of the time to being black. Um, it's an implicit bias. It's been demonstrated by statistics and over and over again that the use of dangerousness is a, a funnel, if you will, to expanding a jail population disproportionately, uh, of course, pre-trial, but disproportionately people of color. I'm proud of my efforts in the legislature as being a leading advocate and reformer uh, that thus far has kept that word out of our bail laws. Okay, um, one more question we have, because the next candidate is here. Um, one second, I just had it here. Um, well, it looks like we're going to go on to the next question. Next candidate. I, if I could find it at the end, um, we'll wrap this up then because uh, people do want to go to the convention. Is um, Tali, are you on? I got an email that she was getting on. Alan, if we have a second, I would love to answer the questions that just came Absolutely. up. Absolutely. It seems as though we do have a second. Great. Well, um, you know, I think that uh, I would absolutely 100% oppose a dangerousness standard. That is simply what judges have used over time and DAs have used to advocate for locking my clients up. 
you know, I've represented thousands of people as a public defender and far too many times they've, they've already tried to use that, though it, the standard does not exist, to lock up predominantly people of color and it just perpetuates the biased and racist nature of our criminal punishment bureaucracy. Um, and then as for the other question that I didn't get a chance to answer regarding uh, the restructuring of the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, as the only person who's gone up against that office for my entire career, I think, you know, I have seen firsthand which district attorneys are likely to want to be a DA or an assistant DA under a prosecutor who is truly reform minded under a public defender who is going to be the, the you know, Manhattan district attorney or who really, you know, fell in line with, with Cy Vance's office and with his policies and with perpetuating locking people up um, and throwing away the key and not thinking about how to um, humanize people and address their underlying issues. Um, okay, I think we're still waiting um, any minute, but um, we've uh, got a question would, there. Oh, Alan, are you, are you looking for me? Oh, you're on. Okay, um, Alvin, you wanted to say something and then we'll go to Tali. Just on dangerousness, look, I, you know, I'm, you know, I've been a black man and a boy in America, so I know these correlations in this data firsthand, and so I certainly am opposed to the, the, the dangerousness addition in that definition. And then Ms. Crotty talked about her, her, her work as a defense lawyer and also being in the office. I think I've got the distinction in this race of being someone who knows how to bring the cases we need, you know, broad cases against landlords, uh, picking on tenants, workers uh, 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 who are being cheated out of their wages and the cases that we need brought. But unlike the other prosecutorial candidates that with that experience, I haven't been in a DA's office. Uh, you know, the only misdemeanor case that I've brought is one uh, on behalf of Planned Parenthood against two people who were blocking staff and patients. So I have the know how to do it, but have not done the kind of cases that have led to mass incarceration. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alvin. Tali, um, Processes three minutes um, to present yourself, and then we're going to go to the toughest questions we could come up with. <laughs> okay, uh, great. So the floor is yours. Thank, thank you. you, Alan. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I'm sorry uh, not to have been with you uh, in the course of the night. Um, I'll, I'll try to use the little time we have left well. Um, so uh, I have been a candidate in this race uh, for exactly a month. And I thought I would introduce myself to you by uh, telling you about the two experiences in my life that I have been leaning on the most, uh, that I've been drawing from in order to articulate uh, my vision for this office and how I think we can keep justice, safety, and fairness in balance. One is the last couple years, which I spent in the office of the Brooklyn District Attorney as his general counsel. And you know that was kind of a new experience for me, Alan, because I had really spent most of my career uh, really focused on national government. I had come up through clerking at the Supreme Court, working at Maine Justice during the Obama administration. I worked for Eric Holder as a federal prosecutor for many years. But when Trump was elected, I resigned from the federal government because I was not going to be able to bring cases in his name. And I turned to local prosecution because Eric Gonzalez was newly elected and he had a vision for making it the model of progressive prosecution in the country while also keeping uh, safety uh, at top of mind. And I thought, well, that's a great thing to go and be a part of. And it turned out to be the most impactful experience of my career, uh, working on harnessing the power of the district attorney to step back from doing the cases that do not advance public safety, and instead using our resources to really fight for the most vulnerable among us. One of the things that I'm the most proud of, Alan, in, from the time that I spent in that office is the Post-Conviction Justice Bureau. I led the design and creation of what I still believe is the only bureau of its kind in the country. And we built that because while so much of the focus of reform, importantly, is on the front end of the criminal justice system, thinking about who enters the system and making sure that we are not prosecuting people unnecessarily and without advancing public safety. This was different. This was to focus on the role of the district attorney in making sure that 
we can hold on to our responsibility to do justice as long as a person is incarcerated until he returns safely to his community. So some of the things we did, for example, are I supervised the most productive, biggest wrongful conviction unit in the country, our conviction review unit. And we put out a huge report just before I left that office chronicling what went wrong in our first 25 exonerations, just laying it all out there so that there could be a reckoning with the kinds of misconduct and poor choices that had deprived people of together a shocking 426 years of their lives spent in prison wrongfully. My team was, as far as I know, the first DA's office we were aware of that advocated for parole. We would send our ADAs to, uh, as best we could, to meet incarcerated people who were applying for parole. We were supportive of parole. We changed the default so that uh, our prosecutors were told to support parole at the first opportunity for folks who had pled guilty unless they could justify a, in writing a reason not to. We supported clemency and I became an advocate for excessive sentencing legislation because I think we have to be able to give people a chance after some number of years to come to court and to say, my sentence is too long. It's not necessary for public safety and it's not consistent with our values today. And I really think we're not gonna get at mass incarceration unless prosecutors take seriously these back end issues as we did. We have to ask you to wrap up. Okay. I will, I will tell you that we expressed our love for Eric Gonzalez many oh, times. Good. Worked very, oh. very closely with our club on many of the issues that um, we care about. Well, um, thank you, Alan. I'm very lucky to have worked for him and to have learned from him. I was going to tell you a little bit about myself personally, but I could put it aside if, if you want to get. Uh, yeah, for now, we want to ask you questions. Um, um, Elder Parole. Well, uh, Elder Parole. Mm -hmm. Okay, you basically answered that. Do you, I want to say what you're on the record for. You're for elder parole, correct? Yes, and, and for okay. something beyond that, which is excessive sentencing legislation. Right. We need new legislation around that as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, um, decrim of sex work. Yeah, so um, I'm not there, Alan, although um, I'm open to revisiting that. But what I'm also not for, and I think this is really important, is prosecuting victims. And I think that for too long, and this is not just true um, when it comes to those cases, but across sex crimes, the focus has been in investigating the victim rather than focusing on the offender and what stands behind the offender. The next question would have been, will you work actively to oppose the Nordic model? Um, uh, no, right now I think that the Nordic model does keep fairness and safety in balance, the, or the equality model as I prefer to call it. Okay, I would offer you if you want to meet with some sex workers that um, have been meeting with people running for district attorney and elected office to hear their side. It would be my pleasure, thank you. I would love to do that. Okay, then I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Um, if elected, would you do as Eric Gonzalez does and visit people um, who are incarcerated and um, hear their cases and possibly plead for clemency and parole for them? Well, as I just told you, yes, I supervised that part of the office. I actually went with DA Gonzalez to Otisville um, and I visited other prisons as well. There's a terrific program called True in the Cheshire Maximum Security Facility, and I think in Jed, which I've been to, and I think in general, it is really important for district attorneys to make a commitment, both to visit prisons in the regular course, and as I said earlier, uh, sometimes we need to sit with somebody who's, let's say, is applying for parole or clemency after many years um, not having been in contact with the office uh, to really understand that person's case. Okay. Um what is your relationship with the LGBT community and on other issues such as abortion, women's rights, um, et cetera? What demonstrations and conferences have you, um, demonstrations and rallies have you gone to and what have you done in the resist Trump movement? Okay. Um, oh my, there's, I'm, I, if I forget, there were like five questions there. You're going to have to remind me. Okay. Uh, so they, let me start they, with they, the back. Community. What's your relationship? Have you marched in pride parades? 
Um, I have not marched in pride parades, but Alan, I think that um, to be a good prosecutor, you have to be sensitive to every community that might find themselves to be the victim of a crime. So for example, in sex crimes, we know that LGBTQ plus people report being the victims of sex crimes and domestic violence at similar or in some cases much higher rates than heterosexuals. And for example, in domestic violence, there are different instruments of control and power that might be asserted in those relationships and that the people who go to respond to them may not be fully aware of. So I try to bring that sensitivity into every part of my work. Um, you asked me about uh, resisting Trump. Is that right? Yeah. What have you done in the resistance movement to remove okay. the fascists from the White House? So I think that all of us are responsible for using every power at our disposal to resist what we see as injustice coming out of this administration. So my team in Brooklyn joined together uh, with the state AG to sue Trump and to sue ICE over their courthouse arrest policy. You know, we had found that ICE had started using us as bait to pick up people, whether they were the witness, the victim, or the defendant in our cases, and throw them into deportation proceedings. And this was interfering with our ability to deliver on safety for very vulnerable people. For example, we saw that women who were the victims of domestic violence had stopped coming forward and reporting. And so we brought that lawsuit. I consider that lawsuit an act of resistance. And I'm happy to say we won. We won in federal court. A federal court declared that practice of ICE illegal in New York State. We okay. also, you know, we, we had other lawsuits that were similar as well. Solitary um, confinement. So I think that solitary confinement uh, is deeply troubling and should be very limited. You're not for doing away with it though. Well, Alan, I'll tell you, the reason I'm thinking about it is because in my own experience as a federal prosecutor, sometimes, and I'm talking about very rare instances, we had to use solitary confinement uh, for the safety of the incarcerated person. I mean, you know, in some complex situations uh, in federal prisons. And so I don't want to give you an absolute answer on that. Okay. Um, Sanctuary City, what proposals will you advocate to protect immigrants and further New York as a sanctuary city? So for me, um, a cornerstone of how I check uh, if I am being the kind of district attorney that I want to be is whether we are protecting non-citizens. There are about 250,000 non-citizens living in Manhattan. And in Brooklyn, we made looking out for non-citizens a major focus of our practice. Um, I told you about the case of suing ICE. Um, ours was the rare office that took collateral consequences for non-citizens into consideration in the way that we charged cases so that we wouldn't let something trigger um, a family separation and a deportation in a way that was unjust. Um, we prosecuted cases where non-citizens were the victims of scams and frauds, for example, by notarios. And Alan, I have to tell you, this is really personal for me because I came to the U.S. Uh, as an immigrant. I, uh, my family and I sought asylum for 10 years. We only found security in our status uh, when President Reagan did an amnesty in the late 80s, and we were finally able to become uh, citizens of the United States. So. Okay. That vulnerability is very personal to me, and I think really the measure of whether we are delivering on justice. Okay. Will you um, refuse to accept money from real estate and people like Steve Roth from Related, who's um, one of the biggest developers and also very close to Trump? So um, I uh, will not refuse to accept money from real estate or from any industry in particular, um, but I am the only candidate, as far as I'm aware, um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, who is only taking $1 from lawyers who have a criminal defense practice in New York and, and their partners. So if they, even if they're in a humongous law firm where somebody else in the firm has a criminal defense practice, because I think the practice of taking money from those lawyers um, as political contributions has led to an insecurity, particularly by victims in this office and a degradation of trust in the office. Um, and so to me, that's the most important conflict and a pledge that I have made. Okay. Um, are there any questions people are sending me? 
Okay. Um, will you will you commit to hiring formerly incarcerated people? Yes, and Alan, I actually think, if I may, I think people all around New York in different industries have to make that commitment um, so that we can have successful reentry for people who are returning from prison. So I think that should happen in the DA's office and um, you know, really across the city. I also think that um, inside a DA's office, it's important to make a commitment um, to hire folks who have been the victims of crimes. And I also think it's important to have a diverse workforce top to bottom. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? If not, we're going to call it an evening. Um, does anyone have something, any of the candidates have something they want to add um, before we close? Alan, um, no, just I didn't get to address it. Because oh. as a result of this, um, there will probably be two or three questions that we didn't put on the questionnaire, and we'll get that to you sometime by um, the end of this week, the very beginning of next week. Um, Janice, did you want to say something? Oh, very briefly, just that I believe solitary confinement is torture and would not support any defendant under our office's jurisdiction being tortured in solitary confinement. I think that's- Can you say question. that louder, please? Yes, uh, I'm categorically, categorically opposed to solitary confinement, and I don't think we should be prosecuting anybody held under solitary confinement. To me, that's a moral issue. Okay. Solitary confinement is often known as torture. Um, okay, any other? Okay, Alan? on that note, a toast to everybody. Alan, Alan what about the club? And about um, I thank you very, very much um, for staying on. And most of you have been on um, for the entire, um, for three hours. <laughs> so thank you all. Alan, uh, Senator Jackson had a question. And other members of the club, please go to our website. Um, we'll get you the questionnaire. We'll be doing our endorsement prior to um, petitioning, obviously. And um, can't say we'll see you on the campaign trail, but we'll see you on the Zooms. Thanks very much. Good night.